Hello, Doug. Hello, Doug. I wasn't here first. I need some sad music with this. The last time I played royalty-free sad music, it wasn't royalty-free, and I got dinged. Huh. But so imagine, imagine really sad music is playing in the background now. This is a note from James. Hello, Doug. I wasn't here first, but I never received pine points before. I received Jesus when I was a Christian, but never my salvation through Doug. Can you please hook a brother up? Oh, my, my heart's melting. <laughs> Camille, go to sleep. You don't need to be here. No, but I'm going to have fun. This is going to be a real fun. This is for my entertainment only. But yes, James, I should not do this. <clears throat> I'm going to get in trouble with Satan from the head office in Wichita, Kansas. But 100 pine points, will that give you hope, meaning, and purpose? 1,000 pine points to Jax, 12. 500 pine points to CS, not Lewis. And 250 pine points to Jose Luis Gonzalez. Okay, I um, I think I found a Marcionite Christian, and uh, and to me this is the most interesting Christian I've ever critiqued. But before I get into that person, who doesn't show their face, so it's not interesting in that sense of you know looking at a guy talking about Jesus and so forth. But he makes some really inter interesting points, and I dare say, gives the best. Okay, if you're a Christian listening, take your hands and whatever chair you're, ha you're hanging on to or sitting on, hang on to that chair with all your might. He gives the best, some of the best, arguments I've ever heard in my life that Yahweh of the Old Testament is actually Satan, or Satan in the Old Testament is actually Yahweh. Now, I know uh, atheists and, and non former non-Christians non who are former Christians often say, yeah, Yahweh and it seems like Satan's better than Yahweh in a lot of cases and so forth. But this guy's making pretty strong arguments that no, they're one and the same entities. Satan is Yahweh, Yahweh is Satan. They're the same thing. And he and he has some verse some really interesting verses that I never really thought of in that way to demonstrate that. Other than just Yahweh being a, a schmuck. So, but uh, this is um um, hey, uh, thank you for the donation, Han Standish. You do know there's no returns, right? Han Standish, it's like once you give, that's it. So it's early on. You might not like what I'm about to say, but I hope you do. Uh, thank you for the donation. But there's, I don't think Christians can shake this. I think they can pretend it, this doesn't exist. I think they can sort of say they have a potpourri of answers to address these things. But I think for the love of Jesus, every Christian alive should become a Marcionite Christian if you want any type of credibility. But then you lose credibility on other things. So uh, the other day, Cameron uh, Bertuzzi from Capturing Christianity was asked this question. I forget this guy's name. Anybody know? Um, about um, the divine, apparently abhorrent divine commands and... And they talk about it at length. I'm not sure if I'll play all of it. But it's like they're not taking this seriously. It's like, oh, I don't have to worry about this. Interested to hear Justin's thoughts on the problem of apparently abhorrent divine commands. I'm referring to Morriston's essay in the BC oh, it's coming. It's coming. to the problem of evil. Do you know what those that abbreviation is to the in the BC? BC. Blackwell Companion? I think that's it. Maybe. The Blackwell Companion to the problem of evil. It's talking about if unless yeah, I don't know. So I'm not sure if I've read this particular Morrison paper, but... Um, yeah, a good point in the live stream chat. If it's true I work for Satan, then do I really work for Yahweh? I don't even know who my boss is anymore. Is, I'm sure I you're mean, familiar with like the, the general idea behind it. Yeah, is he thinking of like the, the problem of... Um, actually, I don't think I've read Morriston's essay. I don't think the, the sort of Paul Copan type of approach is successful. So Copan and, and like Matt Flanagan and people like that have tried to argue that like, look, if we pay attention to the details in the historical context and, and you know, some of the literary tools that are being used here, it turns out that you can sort of 
defend what God did as being morally permissible, as it is depicted in the Old Testament. I'm not convinced that that approach is successful. Um, so sometimes I'm drawn to— I think, is Copen the guy who basically says that uh, most of what's written in the text in the Old Testament about these atrocities is exaggeration? Is that Copen? Or is— yeah, like the when he said smite uh, all the Amalekites, kill all of them. That uh, that's the authors didn't really mean like all of them. It, yeah, this doesn't work. It's just like if just one baby, if just one innocent baby was killed by the command of Yahweh, then not only is there a problem with the internal critique of morality, but you do have a contradiction between the Jesus of the New Testament saying children come unto me and the Jesus. Uh, and the God of the Old Testament saying, let's kill the children. Um, views which say that those stories are not entirely historical, uh, and that raises all kinds of complicated questions about yes. divine inspiration, because I do think that Scripture is inspired by God. Of course, because you're an evangelical. Um, but uh, some, let me think, so... See, yeah, and any... I dare Christians to say, well, the, the author said that, but that's not what actually happened in history. God never really commanded that, even though it says God commanded. There's a real problem. If you start doubting the history and you believe in inspiration of the Old Testament, well, yeah, it says Jesus appeared to 500, but that's not really what happened. Come on. Come on, you Christians. I'm pretending I'm a Christian who takes the Copan type arguments. You set yourself up for huge failure if you say, you start, okay, if I'm doubting this is historical, then I ought to doubt that. And I don't think you can just say, well, but that the Old Testament's so much older, so we can kind of push that aside. No, the New Testament, its foundation is rooted in the Old Testament, a lot of it. Instead of getting into all that, let me just recommend a couple of sources. Um, yeah, so yeah, of course. One, for it to have a very different kind of a meaning than maybe the authors, the human authors had in mind, uh, and so forth. And I think that there's just a lot of rich and philosophically interesting stuff in that book that you might find helpful. Um, and then there was, a, there was a book from a... You notice when Christians get stuck on questions like this. It's like, well, go read so-and-so, go read so-and-so. This person, Jackson Howard, is interested in hearing the thoughts of Justin, that's his name, He's not interested in hearing what other authors from uh, who wrote books think. Hey, what, what's your opinion? A few years ago, I think it was by Greg Boyd. Yes. And it's something about like the crucifixion of the warrior god, yep. I think is what it's called. And it's, yeah, and it's there's two volumes. Yeah, yeah. So it's this two-volume book. And uh, By the way, in my opinion, Gregory Boyd is basically a Marcionite-type Christian. Which I actually haven't read, but as I understand, I guess the basic thrust of this book is that um, it's like a hypothesis about God sort of accommodating to, um, you know, the cultural views of, of the ancient world. And so God is actually depicted. Yeah, just listen to what this Christian's saying. That God's accommodating to the culture of the time. It's, it's, he's basically saying that the creator of the universe, who's supposed to be the basis of objective morality— Grades morality on a moral curve. Well, this culture is not quite ready yet to to be told that that rape and slavery and genocide's wrong. So let me wait. I don't know, two thousand years, three thousand years to get that message across. But in the meantime, I'll slowly nudge them towards the true morality that emanates from my nature. Really. This is the God you believe in? In certain ways that weren't actually accurate in certain parts of the Old Testament. And so that's maybe another place you could go for more information. So these sorts of views I've occasionally been um, drawn to. There's one other uh, view that I think is worth considering. So um, uh, Mark Murphy has a book called God's Own Ethics that was published in 2017. I think it's probably the best philosophy of religion book that's been written in several decades. Uh, it's a real addition to that book. Murphy has a paper. In <clears throat> on, on top of that, I just want to mention that I've written a blog post. Okay, this is uh, what's interesting to me, what Cameron says here. Post called How to Respond to Alleged Old Testament Atrocities. 
That is available at capturingchristianity.com, our website. So just search for that article. And I've written my thoughts on this. I don't, the reason why I haven't spent a whole lot of time on this problem is because I think it's so limited in scope. It lets, if you grant everything so limited in scope, this issue is so limited in scope that the atheist wants or everything that the skeptic wants, then you're not going to get a whole lot out of it. Doesn't matter what the atheist or skeptic wants. It's the atheist and skeptic when they address this issue, they're asking you guys, how do you live with yourselves? Like, we think this is just all like not that your God doesn't exist and your God never said these things and so forth because we don't believe this God exists. But how in the heck do you guys sleep at night if you believe that the God you worship and serve actually did stuff like this? Seriously, how do you sleep? Of it. So suppose that in the Bible, these passages were really meant to, to say this. At most, what we'd need to reject is biblical inerrancy. And rejecting biblical inerrancy doesn't land you in atheism. It doesn't even land you in non-Christianity. It doesn't, Christianity does not hinge on whether some Old Testament passage was... Uh, some Old Testament passage? The Old Testament is rife with this stuff. And even the New Testament is rife with this stuff. For people in Alabama, sorry, for people in Mississippi, sorry, for people in Georgia, rife means very prevalent. Uh, so the Old Testament author meant it some certain way. It doesn't rely on divine or uh, um, biblical inerrancy is, is the point there. Christianity hinges on whether or not Jesus rose from the dead. And so if you have good reason to think that Jesus rose from the dead, then basically you've got to understand what's going on in the Old Testament, but you don't have to go that far either. Yeah, see, but this is the real issue, Cameron. You don't know. You don't know anything about the God you worship and serve then. If Christianity is just about a guy rising from the dead, tell me, Cameron, what is Jesus like? Describe Jesus for me. What's his characteristics? What's his nature like? Does he like chocolate ice cream or vanilla? Does he wear sandals or boots? But now let's get into the deep stuff. Does he like children who are not believers in him or hate them? Does he prefer that they get nurtured and loved or smitten? Does he prefer they poof out of existence when they die or drowned? What is Jesus like, really? This is not something you can sweep under the rug and just say mere Christianity. Appeal to C.S. Lewis or Mike Lacona and say, oh, it doesn't matter about all this Old Testament stuff. As long as Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. As long as Gabriel spoke to Muhammad in the cave, uh, speaking the very words of Allah, then Islam is true. As long as Jesus appeared to, to Joseph Smith and, and gave him where, the location of the golden place, Mormonism is true. You see how ridiculous that is to just reduce it to, well, I don't have to worry about this because as long as Jesus rose from the dead, I'm fine. I'm A-OK. -okay. Don't you want to know if you're worshiping a monster? Don't you want to know what the God you worship and serve is like? If so, you have to take these questions seriously, I would think. There's there's different uh, responses to these that you've, you've already mentioned. There's there's different books written on these, different interpretations of these passages. There's even different, interpret, or, uh, different views of biblical inspiration, like John Walton's view, where he thinks that inspiration lies on the ill. You notice they say stuff like this, different interpretations and, and, and different ways to the context and stuff. They talk like this when they're trying to deal with really bad stuff in the Bible. Typically, usually. Not when they're talking about good verses in the Bible. Locution, on the level of illocution rather than on the level of locution. So when some when uh, a human author would make an error. This good point, D.B. Cisco. I see, I see you in the live stream. I, he says, I, do, I still do not understand why the resurrection is so important other than to mock any sacrifice. Why in the world is the resurrection so important? Like, Lazarus, according to the Gospel of John, rose from the dead. It seems like tens, twenties, a hundred people, thousand, maybe even a thousand people in um, Matthew 27 rose from the dead. Why is resurrections so important? This is his view. It's, a, it's kind of a, a philosophical and kind of a weird view. But it's one that I, I think is actually, it's got a lot going for it. So if there is, if you locate an error in the Bible, 
that is due to some human error on, on someone's part, thinking that the globe or that there was a, a sphere of water above the earth or, or something like that. If you think that you can find an error like that from one of the human authors, then what Walton says is that that error lies on the level of locution. And this is a philosophy of language term, so just go look it up if you want. But inspiration is philosophy on the level term. of divine elocution. And so what God is actually doing with the text. And so there... Oh, David Amareth answer, answers my question, why is the resurrection, and uh, 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 Mr. Sisko's question, why is the resurrection so um, important? David Amaroth, tell me the verse in the Old Testament where it is prophesied that the Messiah would die and rise from the dead. There are different ways of understanding divine inspiration that even if you find a, a, an error like this, you don't have to reject divine and error, you don't have to reject biblical inerrancy. It's really, really interesting stuff. So the, the my point is that the, even if you grant everything the atheist wants with, with this stuff, you're not going to get a lot of traction. You're not going to go very far at all in disproving Christianity or, or arguing that the, the Bible... The issue is not for a skeptic or an atheist or a Muslim or a Mormon or whatever to disprove Christian, Christianity. The issue is for you guys is to how you reconcile this sort of thing and live with yourselves. Okay, um, and here's one way you can do it. And uh, thanks to Nathan Ormond for uh, sending me this. I've seen this a long time ago, uh, but this is great. This is, uh, what's his name? John Piper, Desiring God. I actually used to have his book, uh, one of the few books I've owned. I, I think paper books in general are a waste of money. <laughs> But um, he, he gives a great, great answer on uh, how to deal with this stuff. It's, let me, when I say great, I mean it's horrible, but it's still consistent. For God to slaughter women and children in the Old Testament, how can that ever be right? Yeah. It, it's right for God to slaughter women and children anytime he pleases. Um, God gives life and he takes life. Everybody who dies dies because God wills that they die. So God is taking life every day. He will take 50... I wonder how far he would take that. Anyone who dies, dies because God willed that that person died. Anyone who's raped, it's because God willed that that person be raped. Any person who is tortured to death is because God willed that they be tortured to death. How many Christians... Raise your hand if you're a Christian live stream. I can see your hands, don't worry. Raise your hand if you agree with John Piper here, if you're a Christian. Thousand lives today. Life is in God's hand. God decides when your last heartbeat will be and whether it ends through cancer or whether it ends through um, a bullet wound, God governs. So God is God. God rules and governs everything. I wonder if guys like Cameron Bertuzzi and this Justin guy have the swollen gonads to say what John Piper just said. Could they have the, do they have enough testosterone? <laughs> it doesn't look like John Piper has a lot of testosterone, but I'm curious if they have enough testosterone just to say it like that, to look their followers their wives in the eyes and say, imagine our little, our little baby Myron. You know, if God wanted to torture and drown our little baby Myron, he, that's his right. I wonder if they could do that. Maybe. And everything he does is just and right and good. God owes us nothing. Uh, if, if, if I were to drop dead right now or a, uh, a uh, suicide bomber downstairs were to blow this building up and I would be blown to smithereens, God would have done me no wrong. Yeah, and not only that, if God knows and is never wrong about his foreknowledge, and if, 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 if the future is set and doesn't change, then if God knows that you're going to die from a suicide bomber tomorrow, you don't have the free will to commit suicide today. Otherwise, God knew wrong. He would have been done David no wrong. He, he does no wrong to anybody when he takes their life at age two weeks or at age 90, 92. God doesn't 
is not beholden to us at all. He doesn't owe us anything. Now you add to that that we're all... I disagree, even as an uh, atheist, I can put myself in the worldview of the Christian and say, that is false. God does. I'm, I'm curious to see if any Christians in live stream chat are going to disagree with me on this. God does owe you something. Now, go through your, your Rolodex of verses in your mind and, and see if you can know what I'm getting at. God owes humans something. What is it? He owes you the fulfillment of his promises to you. So God does owe you something, right? I'm just being a little finicky, but... And we deserve to die yesterday and go to hell. The fact that we're even breathing today is sheer common grace from God. So... Um, I could make the question harder. As it was stated, it, it, it doesn't feel hard to me because God was stated as the actor. But if I make it harder, I'll take longer than three minutes to answer the question and you don't want me in this session. So I think m my basic answer is um, the Old Testament and the New presents God as the one who has total rights over my life and over my death. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How he takes away is his call. He never wrongs anybody. <clears throat> I'm curious if John Piper would admit that with rights come responsibilities. If God has the right to take away your life or if God has the right to stop a rape and so forth, if in some way he's responsible for the rape then or the death of someone. I tell you, it is easy for a guy like John Piper to say, God can kill whoever he wants because he's God. But now, can he say God has the responsibility that he is at least partially responsible, if not entirely responsible for th those deaths and those rapes and those tortures? Oh, no, Doug, God, if it's a good thing, God's responsible. If it's a bad thing, he's not. That's how it works. Got it. You state it to make that, that question harder. And what would be your answer? The question that? makes it harder is that he commands people to do it. <laughs> he commanded Joshua to slaughter people. Okay, so you've got human beings now killing human beings. And so now you've got a moral question for what is right to do. So that Why is that any harder for John Piper? If God is God and he has the right to do whatever he wants... Who cares if, if he does it directly or tells another human to do it? You mean the other human might cry? Oh, this is, this, is this is hard. I don't like killing babies. God, please don't make me. Well, who cares if it's hard on those is Israelites to go kill other people? Who cares if they cry about it? God is God, right? They should just take my advice. Cry two hours in the room before they put on their swords and shields and stuff. <laughs> the Bible says, thou shalt not murder... And God says to Joshua, go in and clean house and, he, and, and don't leave anything breathing. By the way, if you just got here, if you came late, uh, this is not the most interesting Christian. Cameron Bertuzzi is not the most interesting Christian. The most interesting Christian is coming up. Don't leave a donkey breathing. Don't leave a child breathing, a woman breathing, an old man or a woman or a donkey. Just wipe out Jericho. And, and so then, then my answer is, there is a point in history, a season in history, where God is the immediate king of a people, Israel. Okay, when he's talking like this, I want you to remember that God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Difference in the way he is the king over the church, which is from all the peoples of Israel and does not have a political, ethnic dimension to it. So there was a political, ethnic dimension. He is immediate king, and he uses this people as his instrument to accomplish his judgment in the world at that time. And God, it says, let the sins of the Amalekites <clears throat> accumulate for 400 years so that they would be full, and then he sends his own people in as his instruments of judgment. So, Okay, now really think about what he's saying here and the, um, the connotation, the implication. The United States has been existing for, what, uh, 300 years or so? Not quite 400 and I think a lot of Christians would say that the United States is getting worse and worse in terms of morality, debauchery, chicanery. Maybe God is viewing the United States of America like he viewed the Amalekites. 
Oh, this is going to resonate with those really fundamental conservative Christians. They're going to like what I say and dislike it at the same time. What if the United States are like the Amalekites and the Canaanites? You know, it's just like gay marriage, really? You know, all those abortions and I, and the sodomites. And, oh, it's just like... Maybe, maybe it is God's will to use countries like Russia, Iran, maybe even North Korea to slaughter out the citizens of the United States. God's God, right? Including all the Christians still in, in the United States, the true Christians like John Piper. Man, this is dangerous when you start thinking this way especially for the other countries who might believe in a God who think the same way that God told us to, to take you guys out. It's God's will. You guys are so evil. You Americans are so evil. I would vindicate Joshua <clears throat> by saying in that setting, with that structure of people and, and God, it was right for Joshua to do what God told him to do, and that is annihilate the people. But that's much more complex morally than saying, God doesn't. He, he, he can cause a flood <coughs> and kill everybody on the planet, except eight people. And he didn't do a one of them anything wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> he can flood the whole planet except for eight people, and he didn't do anything wrong. See, this is, he's right in the sense that if you define wrong and right and wrong based on the nature of this deity, then whatever this deity does by definition is right and never wrong. But then at what point, how do you know the nature of God? If God can do absolutely anything and it is good, how can you recognize goodness? If flooding, drowning babies can be good in a certain context, depending on whether or not God sanctions it, shouldn't you question every moral action you see on the planet, Christians, and say, well, well wait a minute, wait a minute, I know this really looks bad, but what if God sanctioned it? Like, then it's good. You see, uh, man, I'm just so glad. I'm so happy that I don't have to deal with this stuff anymore. But it, for some Christians, it's like, you got to think about this. He else to do that. So whenever God uses others, right now an example would be that God has given the sword to the government. So I believe that the government has a right to take a rapist and a murderer and put him in jail. Do you believe, would you support the government of the United States stoning practicing homosexuals john piper in fact we need to we meaning people like me <laughs> need to ask apologists when they go on their tours and they have those mics going up if you're a non-christian an atheist listening and you ever have that opportunity ask the john pipers of the world ask the frank turks of the world ask the william lane craigs of the world if they would support a united states government that made law the stoning of practicing homosexuals, made law the stoning of people who worship um, Ganesh or Vishnu, made law the stoning of individuals who worshiped Allah, Allah. Would you support that? And, and here's the kicker. If you say, no, I would not support that, give me the scriptural basis why you would not. If John Piper is right that the United States government has the the power to, the sword to um, execute justice on behalf of God, on what basis do you say that would be bad? Or to kill him. I, mean, I think capital punishment is consistent with Genesis 9 and consistent with God's character uh, because of the value of man. By the way, I'm not 100% against capital punishment. That might be a shock to some people. I think it... Um, in cases where it's like 99.99999% confident that someone has killed five people or whatever. And here's the kicker. If the person says, please just kill me now. I don't want to be in jail for the rest of my life. I think the humane thing is to kill them. The blood of a man shall be shed for taking the blood of a man. But that's very different than saying anybody can go around killing people. So God has his times and seasons for where he shares his authority to take and give life. And the church today is not Israel. 
and we are not a political entity, and therefore the word we have from the Lord today is love your enemy, pray for those who abuse you, lay your life down for the world, don't kill in order to spread the gospel, die in order to spread the gospel. Okay, he's just showing the internal contradiction within the Bible. Jesus says, love your enemy. Yahweh says, go kill them. I am saying it as simple as I can. The fact that you even have a new covenant versus an old covenant tells you you do not have a consistent story from Genesis to, uh, to Revelation. I think what I just said is extremely reasonable. New Testament, Jesus says, love your enemies. And in the Old Testament, Jesus says, kill them. Am I wrong? Now, if you're a Trinitarian, what I said is correct, right? Now, if you're a Unitarian or whatever, that's different. You would say, no, that's not Jesus in the Old Testament. Okay, now here is the most interesting person, interesting Christian I have seen on the YouTubes. It's a good God channel, and one of my subscribers emailed me and said, Doug, you got to watch this guy. And um, let's see, this is long, but I'm not, there's no way I'm going to play all of this. I'm just going to play a little, a few excerpts here and there. And I'm going to start, and I'll give you the punchline first. So if you have to go uh, out later tonight to um, go to the movies with the kids or something, I don't know what, what you do for fun. <laughs> Here's the punchline. The punchline is this Christian believes that Yahweh in the Old Testament was actually Satan. And that there's this veil of deception in the Old Testament. And that if you're a true Christian, it is painfully obvious that Jesus has nothing to do with the God of the Old Testament. That number one, they're separate. They're still a trinity. I, th this, I think this guy, uh, I forget his name. Bobby Collier is his name. But he, I think, is a Trinitarian. But he just flat out says that the Yahweh depicted in the Old Testament is not just a made-up thing, but Yahweh is actually Satan, and Satan's actually Yahweh. Okay, so let's uh, let's hear him out a little bit. He says, do not say, I am tempted by God. Okay, so God is not the tempter. Satan is the tempter. Okay, so 2 Samuel 24, 1 and 15. Again, the anger of the Lord Yahweh was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. So the Lord Yahweh sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time. From Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. Okay, so notice in this passage, um, in the New King James, it uses the term Lord, but the actual word is Yahweh. Um, other people call it Jehovah. Okay, but it's, it's all the same. Capital L-O-R-D and Yahweh and Jehovah, it's all the same. It's all the same thing. Okay, so again, the anger of the Lord, Yahweh, was aroused against Israel. So God was angry, and he, God, Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh moved David against them. Yahweh tempted King David to commit this sin. Okay, now, if depending on how you interpret this verse, I can see how a Christian could say, or how a person, most Christians wouldn't say this, but I can see how someone can view this as God tempting David, which is a contradiction because it says in other verses in the New Testament, God tempts no one. But please don't read ahead to number four. Okay, he tempted King David to go number Israel, and then as a result of the temptation that he himself started, then he decides to bring a plague to punish everybody except the one who sinned. Okay, Yahweh killed 70,000 people, but he did not kill David, who was the one who sinned. Okay. Which is another tension, because it says in Ezekiel that the pe person who sins is responsible for that sin, not other people which goes against the whole Adam and Eve and original sin idea, but we'll leave that on the shelf for now. Well, that's a contradiction to what it says up here. The soul who sins shall die. Okay, well, that's a problem. And the soul who sins shall die, but King David, he's the one who sinned upon the temptation of Yahweh to make him sin. And then Yahweh contradicts what was said back in, in Ezekiel, and he sends a plague and kills 70,000 people. Well, that's just crazy. And then it also says, <laughs> yeah, it going is. back to James, that God does not tempt anyone. Let no one say, I'm tempted by God. Well, it explicitly says right here that Yahweh tempted King David tempted him to commit a sin, he committed the sin, and then he brought an unjust punishment of killing 70,000 men, but yet it's supposed to be the soul who sins dies. So there's something... Now, I don't know what a guy like Cameron Bertuzzi does with this. 
Does he just say, oh, no, no, I don't know. I, I, that maybe never happened. Wrong here. Well, if we go to First Chronicles 21, 1 to 14, it's the same exact passage written by a different author. Yes. Now, here's the kicker. Okay, Christians, if you're listening, make sure you're sitting down. I double-checked. I think maybe there's a way to get out of this, but here's the kicker. We have two stories in two different parts of the Old Testament, Samuel and Chronicles. They seem like they're identical stories. In one, it says, Yahweh aroused against Israel. And in the other story, it says, Satan stood up against Israel. Not the exact wording, but it's the same story. Now, what was the first impetus, the first cause of this? Was it Satan or was it Yahweh? Now, this guy, who I think is borderline Marcionite, is saying, they're the same person. Yahweh is Satan. Satan is Yahweh. Now, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So the Lord Yahweh sent a plague upon Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. Okay, so look at this. What we see is that the names Satan and Yahweh are actually synonymous in these two passages. This is the exact same passage. Second Samuel and First Chronicles, it's the exact same passage. One says, the Lord, Yahweh, was aroused against Israel and moved King David to sin. The other says, now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to sin. Now the second one makes sense to us because we know Satan is the tempter. We know Satan is evil. We know Satan is unjust and unfair. We, um, we would expect him to do something like this. Okay, then in the same passage, it switches from the name Satan to the name Lord and Yahweh. And so what we need to open our eyes to is that Yahweh and Satan are synonymous names. <laughs> this is why I titled this The Most Interesting Christian on YouTube. By the way, I'm quite sure this guy talking right now loves Jesus. I am quite sure that the guy talking right now believes that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, died for the atoning of the world. Well, he might be a Calvinist, I don't know. I doubt it. But believes in the resurrection and all that jazz. This is not some dirty atheist saying these things, that Satan is Yahweh and Yah or Yahweh is Satan. This is a Christian saying this, and I love it. This passage, Yahweh and Satan are, the, are referring to the same person, to the same being, and it's an evil being. So first of all, Yahweh, Satan, brought a temptation to commit sin. Then Yahweh, Satan, unjustly punished 70,000 people and did not kill David, who was the one who committed the sin. So you can see this is just super revealing. The name's Yahweh, and say oh uh, frozen sea asked about uh the book of job he gets into that i'm not sure if it's in this video or another video i watched but if you read the book of job his um hypothesis gets even stronger that yahweh and satan are basically the same entity but it's almost told from the point of view of two separate entities but it's basically hey they were on the same page satan wants to go ruffle the feathers of job Yahweh says, ah, yeah, go ruffle the feathers of Job. Satan are interchangeable in this passage. Who is Yahweh? Who is Jesus? This is what I was asking of Cameron Bertuzzi when he's just brushing this aside and saying, uh, we got so many different ways we can answer this. It's, it's not uh, central to Christianity. We don't have to worry about this. As long as you believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, you'll be fine. No, 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 no. You do not even know who Jesus is, Christians. If any of this is even somewhat true about what the Old Testament, if it's, if it's even somewhat historical, if, if Yahweh actually exists, and if Jesus is actually Yahweh as one part of, person of the Trinity, you can't just brush this stuff off to the side. Okay. Let's read these. I, I, I should gaslight you here. You should be, you should question your own sanity on this. <laughs> If you've been going through life thinking all is fine, I don't have to read the Old Testament. I don't have to think about this stuff. Points. When most people read the Old Testament, they believe that Lord, Yahweh, is solely the Father. And that's why people have a messed up image of God. They read the Old Testament and they think that Father is mean and he will smite you and he will kill you and he will curse you. He will put some cancer on you to teach you something, to punish you. you know, and they get a messed up image of God because they think that Lord, Yahweh, is the Father. Only a portion of the character of Lord or Yahweh is actually our Father. In this particular passage, we see clearly that Lord Yahweh is in fact Satan. Lord equals Yahweh equals Satan equals Jehovah equals devil equals Leviathan equals dragon equals serpent equals beast. We're going to see as we go on through our teaching series, all those things are true. 
Number- yeah, uh, <clears throat> I'll because because I don't want to play all of this. He goes into the Book of Revelation, and when you t- hear about Satan and some of the things he does in the Book of Revelation, fire from heaven, um, acts like a dragon. A dragon. I'm Canadian. Forgive me. Dragon in my garage. <laughs> You can find Old Testament passages where that describes Yahweh, bolts of lightning and fire from the heavens, that God is, Yahweh is the the, um, Leviathan, and he gets into that later. I'll leave the link in the um, description later. Number seven, this is a clear example of the veil over the Old Testament where we have a confused image of God. All good words and deeds of the Father and all evil words and evil deeds of Satan. They... The name of this channel is Good God. And again, I'll put a link in. We're all attributed to Yahweh, to God, to Lord, to Jehovah. They're all attributed to that, to that same God name. The people didn't know that there were two different beings, that there was a good father and that there was an, an evil um, devil. They just thought all good and bad was all from the one deity. Okay, then number eight. Jesus. Okay. You've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And so Jesus is our measuring stick to determine what spirit is in operation. So we're going to use this, these two pages of scriptures coming up, and there's others we can use to evaluate the Old Testament and any other passage of scripture in the Bible. We will use these, these words, these scriptures to evaluate and determine who is acting in the name God. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all this, but let's just look at the highlights. And this is the question I asked hypothetically of Cameron Bertuzzi earlier. Who is just the Jesus person? What is he like? Well, here's the answers. Jesus is the Lord. And if you know him, you know the Father. And he is light. And in Jesus, there is no darkness. Now, think, this is a little precursor here. Think about all the times where Yahweh is revealed in the Old Testament as darkness, as being in a cloud, a dark cloud. Jesus, who's he? He's the person who would never tempt you, which means tested, tried, punished by God. Oh, that's totally opposite to the God of the Old Testament in some cases. Now, the thief, Satan, does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. I can't think of any examples on top of my head. Well, no, stealing, yeah. Did Yahweh command the stealing, the killing, and the destruction of of, uh, groups of people that possessed the promised land? You definitely, if you're a Christian, have to say, yeah, or evangelical fundamentalist Christian, you definitely say, yeah, of course, yeah, Yahweh commanded the killing and the destruction. Stealing, well, that's just the spoils of war, Doug. Come on. But... In the Gospel of John, if you believe Jesus said this stuff, says that, no, no, that's what Satan does, not God. I, Jesus, have come that they may have life, not to kill people, but to give them life, and that they might have it to the full, more abundantly. Okay, Hebrews 13.8. The Father, you're of the spirit of the devil. Okay, they wanted to do just like Elijah and call fire down. Elijah burned people alive and kill them by calling down fire in the name of Yahweh. And Jesus is saying that's the wrong manner of spirit. Jesus says, I didn't come to destroy, but I came, come, came to save lives. Again, Jesus is telling us that he's not a killer. And if Jesus isn't a killer, if Jesus isn't a destroyer, then neither is our Father because Jesus is the image of the Father. Yeah, this is just, it is so blatantly clear that we have this tension. At least the Christian has to admit that there's this tension here between what God is like in the New Testament versus what God is like in the Old Testament. First Peter 5 eight. be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Okay, our father's not walking around looking for somebody to kill. Satan is. The devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. All throughout the Old Testament, Yahweh was going around. He was stealing, killing, destroying. He was devouring lives. He was consuming lives. He, Do Christians disagree with that? He was doing all these evil deeds. Okay. Our New Testament revelation says that. the adversary is the devil, and he's the one who's going around devouring. Hebrews 2.14. This one's huge. Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Okay, notice, Jesus came to destroy the one who had the power of death. Who has the power of death? God does not have the power of death. The devil has the power of death. Our Father Ooh. does 
God does not have the power of death. The devil does. Oh, oh, John Piper here would definitely disagree with that. He just said, uh, if he came late, that no, no, it's God who decides who dies and when. Not have the power of death. Satan is the one who has the power of death. Our father cannot kill. Jesus cannot kill. They do not have the power of death. The devil has the power of death. Our father is not killing. He's not stealing. He's not destroying. He's not making sick. Yeah, right at this point, if you haven't already, but at this point, this guy, God, good God channel, has lost 99% of evangelicals. Power of death belonged to the devil, and Jesus came to destroy the one who had that power. That is the devil. That is huge. All the killing in the Bible is the devil. Our father does not have the power of death. He has the power of life and life abundantly. But yet he's right. Hebrews 2.14 does say he might destroy him who had the power of death. Who is the God of the world, Christians? The devil. Who has the power of death, Christians? According to Hebrews 2.14, the devil. But who killed and destroyed a ton of people in the Old Testament? Not the devil. It was Yahweh. And this guy's thesis is they're the same person. 1 Corinthians 15.26 The last enemy... The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Death is an enemy of God. Death is not from God. Death is from the devil. Death is absolutely and entirely against the will of God. It is the polar opposite. The will of God is life and life abundantly. The will of Satan is death, destruction, stealing, killing, destroying. These are polar opposite wills. Our death... I agree with him here. I don't... Yeah, I, polar opposite. ...is an enemy of God. It is not a tool of our Father. Our Father did not drown all the earth. Our Father did not rain down fire from heaven and burn alive his own create creatures our father does not have the power of death yahweh the devil has the power of death see i would so love to have the this guy uh sitting next to uh frank turek or cameron bertuzzi or whoever some apologist that i cr often critique and just have them go at it on this and actually force force guys like cameron bertuzzi frank turek uh william lane craig to say no, no, you're wrong. My God does kill people. My God does drown babies. You are a blasphemer. Get away from me. My, like, I actually have to aggressively defend the Yahweh of the Old Testament and say that this guy's wrong. Jesus came to destroy him who had the power of death. This is absolutely huge. We have to rethink every single scripture that's, that says, or that we think says, God killed somebody. We have to rethink it. Maybe God of this world killed somebody, but not God our Father. Okay? The Bible says that Satan is the ruler of this world. He's the God of this world. He's the prince of the power of the... Which, uh, just to bother the people who love Michael Heiser, uh, you guys believe in at least... You guys. <laughs> many Christians believe in at least two gods. The God of this world, Satan, and the one and true God, I mean, the most powerful God, the creator God, Yahweh, uh, Jesus, and God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit which is one God, but you overall believe in two gods, which if polytheism is the def if the definition is the belief in more than one God, that they exist, then you're polytheists. Air is a ruler of darkness. It says all these things about him. He is the one who does all of the killing. Amen? Amen. Our daddy's much different. Acts 10.38. Okay, here we have... Notice he called Jesus our daddy, and I've often done that in my live streams where I've called Jesus daddy. All three of the Godhead are in agreement. How God, the Father, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, notice several verses talking about curses that the Lord, Yahweh, was going to bring upon the people. Hey, thank you for the donation, Michelle Eagleston. Uh, have you seen, heard about the incorrectly baptized Catholic priest in Detroit who caused a chain reaction of invalid sacrament? Yes, I have seen that. That's absolutely hilarious. I saw it on uh, The Friendly Atheist. Okay, notice. Thank you for your donation. When you read those curses, it says the Lord. Okay, so he's basically saying how good Jesus is. And let's see here. Yeah, so all these verses about how wonderful Jesus is, and that he would never kill anybody. But now, let's compare that to Yahweh, shall we? And snakes, when his children ask for... Oh, yeah, this one I forgot about. And this is a great contradiction slash tension. Okay, well, let's read Numbers 21, 5 to 9. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. 
So the Lord Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we okay, so he really said the most important part here. But here we have some complaining, some complaining being done by the Israelites about there not being any food or water. And what does Yahweh do? He sends them fiery serpents among the people, and they bit them, and many of them died. Yahweh killed his own chosen people. Now look what it says in Matthew 7. If I was to ask Cameron Bertuzzi, what's Jesus like? Please describe Jesus for me. It's like if someone asked me what my wife is like, I could do it. Well, explain what Jesus is like. And if I asked Cameron Bertuzzi, if a child of God asked Jesus for some bread, would he give them a stone or a serpent instead? Well, according to Matthew 7, 9 to 11, it says, if his son asks for bread, he will give him, will he give him a stone? No, Jesus wouldn't give his child a stone if they ask for, or for uh, bread. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If a regular human being, a father like myself, if my, if my daughter was hungry and she asked for some bread, here, eat this stone. No, daddy, I'm so hungry. Give me something to eat. Can I have some bread? No, daughter, here's a serpent that can bite you. And then in verse 11, it says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who's in heaven give you things to those who ask him? Now compare that to what we just read. God's chosen people in Egypt asking for food and water and Yahweh was cranky, I guess, and sent them fiery serpents which bit and killed them. Will the real Jesus, will the real God stand up? But if this guy's right, it all makes sense. Because the owner of this channel, Good God, is basically saying, no, this is not Jesus. This is not God here. This is Satan. Yahweh is Satan. Satan is Yahweh. Now, if you think that this guy is just way off base. If you're a Christian listening, you just think this guy is a heretic. He is a Marcionite. He just doesn't know what he's talking about. He's taking these verses out of context. He is causing division amongst Christians. If you're that type of Christian saying this to yourself right now, he's not alone in as far as theists goes. Here is... Tovia Singer on the topic of Satan. I think I got it queued up, right? We'll see. Now, the idea that, you could, that Satan is an enemy of God is not biblical because the only thing we're interested in is what is God's opinion? Meaning, what does Tanakh say, the Hebrew scriptures say? If you're a Christian, listen carefully. You, the, the, the way to approach, because you want to know the truth, right? More than anything, you want to know, I don't want to live a lie, I want to know what the truth is. The only way you're going to be able to apprehend what that truth is, no matter where it takes you, is to start with the Jewish Bible, and then use that as a measuring tool, as a rod, a measuring ruler. That's what the word canon means, it's a read. From the Hebrew Bible, measure every claim, including the Christian claims. The Christian, the notion that Satan is an enemy of God is completely unknown to the Jewish scriptures. No angel. Now, how can an Orthodox Jew say such a thing? Are you shocked if you're a Christian listening? Like, shouldn't you be shocked? He, he, here's a Jew who believes in Yahweh, unlike the other guy who says Yahweh Satan. But this guy who believes in God, believes in miracles, all that sort of thing, his name's Toby Singer, says that Satan's not an enemy of God. Satan is his messenger. Satan is his, his gopher. It's like Yahweh needs uh, some Diet Coke. Hey, Satan, go get me some Diet Coke. Yahweh needs to take out uh, 70,000 people. In the Israelite tribes, Satan, go take them out. Send some plagues for me, will ya? I'm watching my favorite show, Dancing with the Stars, right now. So can you go do that for me? <laughs>
led into rebellion against God. Satan was forged and created by God. Evil was created by God in order to give us free will. And it says so. Ooh, did you catch that? Evil was created by God. This is like a little uh, John Piper-ish to me, but it's like not holding back. It's like, hey, you weak need liberal tree hugger, granola crunching, sandal wearing type Christians and Jews or whatever. No, don't back down. Don't shy away from this stuff. Satan is not an enemy of God. You will not find that in the Old Testament as Satan being the enemy. He is God's messenger to fulfill a certain role to help um, God fulfill his decrees. Openly in Isaiah 45, verse 7, the context of Isaiah 45 is that Cyrus, God chose the pagan, who may have been a Zoroastrian, incidentally, but God chose a pagan to tell the Jews to return back to the land of Israel. And God says, don't question my ways. And Cyrus was the person, Scripture says, who did not know my name. Now, one of the things when I teach Scripture is, Isaiah and all of them were always answering an unspoken question. The question there... By the way, I don't know whether to call this the outsider test for faith or insider test for faith. Because I've been basically showing how this guy disagrees with this guy, which disagrees with this guy, which disagrees with this guy. I just don't know what to do anymore. It's like, <laughs> is it any wonder why it's so difficult to evangelize Christians? There is, is, why do you do things that way? Well, God says, in this case, don't question me. I know what I'm doing. So God created evil. He says explicitly in Deuteronomy 14 and 15, before you, I, and this is God speaking, a place before you, good and evil, life and death, so that you might choose good. Evil, Satan is put on this world for the, as a servant of God for the purpose of seducing men, casting forth his blandishments so that we can choose good over evil. If there was no Satan in the world, Imagine a world where there was no Satan. Let's use the rule of, that I taught earlier, where I said if you have a conundrum in Scripture, it's sometimes a good idea to say, well, play the game, what if? What if Satan never existed? God never created Satan. Or, in Christian terms, if there was no evil, or this bad evil angel never exist, existed, what would the world look like without Satan? Well, here's what it would look like. Humans would, are created in the image of God. We would have nothing pulling us away from God. We'd have no free will. We would be like your dog. Why do you love your dog so much? Why are dogs called man's best friend? Because they're always loyal. Okay, so he goes on to basically explain what the reason Satan exists. It's to help give people free will. Because without Satan tempting you, without Satan kind of trying to pull you away from God, you would just be automatically drawn to God, and, uh, and then that's that, and you wouldn't have free will. But how did... Who tempted Satan to leave God? That's my question for Tovia. If Satan's job is to help free will and tempt people away from God, who tempted Satan away from God in the first place? It must have been God, right? Because who else existed? What else existed? Like, I, I what? Help, help. Is there, is there any Christians that can help me with this? Now, I've heard some Christians say that evil is not a, not a thing to be created. But it is pretty clear, I think it's in Deuteronomy, that Yahweh created evil. That Yahweh creates light and darkness. That is kind of a thing. So I need help here. If I'm going to follow, if I'm going to become a Christian, follow Jesus, do I take Cameron Batuzzi's stance that, that this stuff's not important, and that all that's important is whether a man rose from the dead? Do I take John Piper's stance that, that uh, God is God and he can do whatever he wants, so just shut up and take it? Do I take this guy's opinion? His name is, uh, I forget, Bobby. Bobby from the Good God channel. That the... The stuff in the Old Testament, all that bad stuff that Yahweh did, it's actually Satan. That Satan is Yahweh, Yahweh is Satan in the Old Testament. And should I become like a Marcionite type Christian and just reject all that stuff and just cherry pick the good stuff I want out of the New Testament? Or should I become a Jew 
and just say, oh, yeah, no, no, Satan is real. It's separate from Yahweh, but they work hand in hand together. What, Satan, what God wants, Satan sometimes does for him. He's his gopher. He's on the payroll. Satan's on God's payroll. Which theism should I pick? The one that's true, right? Which one of these is true? The Jewish, the Marcionite, the Calvinist, or these evangelicals? Why can't anybody help me? Oh, I forgot about the Muslims. The Muslims is pretty close to the Jews, but they probably have a different take on, the, on uh, Satan. By the way, getting back to this guy, here's his problem. His problem is he's viewing Jesus as this oh, lovey-dovey, wonderful man who just loves children and, and would never hurt a fly. But yet this is the Jesus who spoke of weeping and gnashing of teeth and separating the goats from the sheep and, and telling that parable in the Gospel of Luke about uh, uh, Lazarus going in the bosom of Abraham and and then the guy in hell saying, let me go and warn my family. And says, no, no, you stay where you are. Let them burn. They got the scriptures. If a man comes back from the dead, if, if, that, if, they, if they're not going to believe because of the scriptures, why would they believe if a man comes back from the dead? Does that sound like something weird, a weird thing to say, given the resurrection of Jesus? That you don't believe based on the resurrection, but it's on the scriptures? It's another contradiction for you, or tension. Now, let me give my take on all this. The reason why we have Tovia Singer saying one thing, this guy who I'm going to call a Marcionite, even though he probably isn't, saying a different thing, and John Piper the Calvinist saying a different thing it's still, and this evangelical just not knowing what to think. You know what the reason for all this is? Because you're worshiping, you're reading, you're valuing a man-made text, texts, plural. The most plausible explanation to me is that you're reading these ancient texts and depending what you value and the culture you were raised in, you side with Tovia or you side with this uh, liberal Marcionite type Christian, progressive Christianity we'll call it, or you side with this Calvinist, or you side with these Armenian non-Calvinist evangelicals. You just pick the interpretation that you resonate with, that makes you feel good, or bad. So maybe some people like to feel bad, so they choose it. But it's very plausible to me that all these guys are wrong. But we could solve this problem really quickly. I got a chair right here. No, you can't see it. Oh yeah, there it is, see? I got a chair right here. And Jesus could come and clear this up right now. He could, right? If he's real and all powerful. Come right now sit right next to Pine Creek. This would be the most viral YouTube video in the history of YouTube videos if Jesus came right now, sat on this chair, did First Kings 18 for me first uh, to prove that he's God. And uh, tell me what's up. Is Satan really Yahweh? Is Satan the enemy of God? Or is he a messenger for God? Is, does it really, is, is the Old Testament even like historically accurate? Did you, Jesus, even actually rise from the dead bodily? What, what's, tell me the truth. Because it seems like everywhere I look, I get different answers. By the way, in the live stream chat, I put um, an invitation not to come to the front and give your life to Satan. But <laughs> if, if there are Christians in the live stream chat right now, or Jews, or Muslims, the question on the table is this. 
who is Satan to you and how do you deal with the Old Testament stuff? If you want to come on, I'm going to just give a few minutes and um, I can give you a link. You don't have to show your face. All you can do is talk if you want. Let me give the link now here. It's uh, www.whereby.com forward slash Pine Creek. And uh, let me get that set up just in case anybody comes. Dean, if you're still here, can you um, copy and paste that like every five minutes? But if you have to leave, I understand. Like for, for non-Christians, for atheists who weren't raised in this stuff, I understand if this is absolutely nuts, crazy, and boring. I get that. But for guys like me, this is like incredibly interesting. Okay, I got the room. It's locked right now. But if someone wants to come in, it's whereby.com forward slash Pine Creek. But only come in if you actually believe that uh, Jesus is real or God is real or Yahweh is real or Satan is real. And uh, I wouldn't even, I, I'm actually really curious to know what the uh, Muslim take is on Satan. My guess is it's very similar to the Jewish take. The music doesn't mean I'm leaving. It just gives me dopamine rush. Yeah, I understand the Jews don't worship Jesus. And in fact, some Jews view Christians who worship Jesus as idolaters. And I don't blame them. I think even Christians would admit that if Jesus is not God, if the Trinity is false, every single Christian on the planet that worships Jesus as God is committing idolatry, which puts you in a situation worse than atheists. Like, if you're a Christian, and if you are wrong, if you are a Trinitarian Christian, and if you are wrong about Jesus, you should be more scared of hell than an atheist. Because at least we're not worshipping a false god. You guys are, if you're wrong. So whenever a Christian brings up Pascal's wager, you remind him about that. Like, I laugh when a Christian brings up Pascal's wager. Well, if, if I'm right, you gain everything. But if I'm wrong, I lose nothing. Ho, 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 ho. No, Christians, no. If Tovia Singer's version of theism is true, I tell you, if even the Muslim view of theism is true, Christians are in way more trouble than atheists. Is that gaslighting? Like, I don't know how you sleep at night. Like, tonight you really shouldn't get any sleep because you could spend eternity in hell for worshiping Jesus. Right? Wait a minute. I'm getting... I'm getting uh, what? Satan's coming through here. He's telling me that Christians don't lose any sleep about this. What? They should. Like, shouldn't they ask him what if they're wrong? David Amaroth asks, 
So in your worldview, molecules somehow forming themselves from nothing, which violates the laws of conservation to the largest scale possible, but you want proof of God? Oh, oh, no, I've been found out. David, you gonna make me cry. Okay, let's make this a teaching moment. <laughs> oh, that sounds so condescending, right? Yes, I believe I'm made up of molecules and atoms, but I'm a complex organism that through millions of years, those molecules and atoms have arranged themselves in complex ways to form a complex or organism that can slow down and consider things. Remember the past. Think about the future. Thus, we can ask moral questions. And I don't need proof of a god. All I need is my confidence raised. What would raise my confidence, David, is if you said to me, Jesus is real, and said, I can show you, I can demonstrate it by taking toilet paper, soaking it in water, and asking Jesus to rain down fire from heaven to light it up on fire, just like he did for Elijah. David, if God can do that for Elijah, why can't he do that for me? Am I not as important as Elijah? Am I not loved like Elijah was loved by Yahweh? But David, even if you, Christianity is true, maybe I'm just blinded. I'm blinded from my sinfulness. I've suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. And the only way I can get unstuck, David, is for the God that you believe is true to regenerate my life. David, can you help me with this? Can you help me get the spark that I need to believe? I'm not doing it right, that's why. CM Gold, are you talking to me? You have to come to faith before giving that kind of power. How do I do that, David? I want to give my life to Christ right now, right tonight. How do I do it? You tell me. What are? What is the protocol? What words do I have to say? What? What do I have to sincerely believe? even though I don't believe. Can I force myself to sincerely believe on something that I'm not convinced of? David, can you believe that Obama is president of the United States right now? Can you? Can you sincerely believe that Obama is the president, president of the United States right now? Watch this. Now, I've been told, this is getting serious now. I've been told that there's certain things you have to confess with your mouth in order to be a Christian. That's not all of it, but it's part of it, right? I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died for my sins and rose again. Now, I can say those words. I don't believe any of that's true. How do I believe that's true? Christians, help me. How do I believe that that's actually true? And if you say, well, look at the transcripts. <laughs> really? Is that why you're a Christian? Because of the, the thousands of transcripts? Well, look at the martyrdom. Really? You think 100 years afterwards that people saying that some other people died don't know if they had a chance to recant. Don't know if they died because of their belief in the resurrection or if it was just sedition or it's right next to a whole bunch of other crazy apocryphal stuff. Even the Bible says very little about the martyrdom. You're just so quick to believe things that happened that was written down 100 years later. Even Sean McDowell admits this, and he wrote a thesis on it. Come on, help me believe this stuff. 
Tell me. Same with you, Muslims, Jews. Muslims, please help me. Help me understand or help me to believe that God, Yahweh sent, no, sorry, Allah sent Gabriel down to earth to tell a guy named Muhammad uh, certain things that caused the creation of the Quran. Help me believe that. Why should I believe that? And if that's true, why couldn't, uh, why isn't Mormonism true? Muslims, how, how do I believe that? Why is that true? Why do you believe that's true? Jews, same thing. Why do you believe God spoke to Moses? Because it says so. Why do you believe there was the burning bush? Oh, I got someone. I knew if I turned the music off, someone would come in because the, the music is horrible. Um, oh, are they here and then gone? If whoever came in, you can try again. Maybe they had to set their settings. But the room is locked, so you have to enter the room. And then I press a button. I can see who you are. And then I decide whether or not to let you in. Yes, yeah, Scientology is the one true religion. Yes, I am an atheist. And that means no matter what anyone has done throughout, good or bad, is ultimately meaningless. Oh, that hurts. How is it that there's so many atheists on this planet? It's a small percentage, but still a big number. Why aren't they all just committing suicide? Now, don't get me wrong, some do, but I tell you, more Christians commit suicide than atheists in raw numbers. I dare you to disagree with me on that one. In fact, David, that what I just said is an interesting question. If there's if atheism is just meaningless, why is it there's more Christians committing suicide than atheists? Riddle me that. The music is Say Goodnight. That's the name of the song. I am not a nihilist. I find I choose to find meaning in things. which is the same things what Christians and Muslims and Jews do. They choose to find meaning in the Quran or the Torah or the New Testament. Reported B says, I'm a Muslim and I believe that God sent Gabriel to Muhammad to give him revelation. If you want to believe in it, look into the miracles in the Quran in there. So is that the reason why you believe that Gabriel went to Muhammad is because of miracles in the Quran? How do you know the miracles in the Quran are true and actually happened? And if you believe that there were miracles in the Quran, do you believe that there are miracles in the New Testament? And if you say yes, do the miracles in the New Testament point to Jesus as God in flesh? And if you say no, do the miracles in the Quran, let's say they did happen, point to the truth of Allah in the Quran. You see, there's so many problems here. I don't have to justify my meaning by way of evolution. I just have it. Now you can say, well, that's because God gave it to you, Doug. And I can say, okay, we can agree to disagree. By the way, that's one of the worst things you can say to a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew. Let's just agree to disagree. Actually, I take that back. Jews really don't care that much. <laughs> but it's a pretty bad thing to say to Christians. It's like, no, no you, don't you understand? There's, there's eternity of hell awaiting you, or you won't go to heaven, or you won't have life to the full. I tell you, I got 200. Is that right? I know there's, there's Jews... Muslims and Christians in this live stream chat. Oh, here we go. Uh, let's see who's here. I th 
Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. What's your name? Um, Akul. Akul? Yeah. How do you spell that? Um, A-K-U-L. A-K-U-L. Do you want to show your face or no? Um, maybe just uh, keep it anonymous. I don't know. Okay, so just your voice? That's fine. Yeah. So, um, did you want to help me with something? Um, I don't know. I just kind of uh, saw the link and joined. Are you? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what it is. Are you a theist? Uh, no. You're an atheist. Yeah. Okay. Were you ever a theist? Yeah, I was. I was. In what? What? Yeah. I I was a Hindu. You're a Hindu. Yeah. Oh, I've never actually got to talk. I, well, no, once or twice. Yeah, twice I've talked to Hindus, but they were like Krishna and sort of Hindu. What type of Hindu were you? Um, well, I was... The, the thing with Hinduism is like it's kind of... Like everyone has a different sort of idea about it. There's no like one set thing that you have to kind of follow. Right. So like every person you ask will have a different idea about, about God. So... Why did you leave? Um, well, I just kind of, like, I learned about science, and then I learned that evolution was a thing, and that we didn't really need God to explain anything. Okay, okay, uh, this, is, this is great, because there's a Christian named David in the live stream chat right now. Mm -hmm. When you were a Hindu, did you have meaning and purpose in life? Not, not now, but I'm thinking when you were a Hindu. I think so, yeah. But Hinduism is false. So how could you have meaning and purpose? <laughs> I don't know. See, this is the thing. This is what a lot of Christians will say stuff like, well, you don't have meaning and purpose in life if you are an atheist. But yet, if they say that to the atheist, they have to say that to the Hindu. Because mm -hmm. cr Christians yeah. believe, well, at least evangelical Christians believe that Hinduism is false. They're worshiping false gods. Right. They don't exist. So basically, evangelical Christians, hear me out here. If you say to the atheist, you can't have any basis for meaning, purpose, hope, all that sort of thing, you have to say that to every worldview other than your own. Yeah, probably Islam as well. And even Judaism. Yeah, even Judaism, because Judaism, they're not worshiping the true God, which is the Trinity God. Right? Yeah. So did you lose, like, hope, meaning, and purpose when you left Hinduism? Not really, no. Like, why aren't you... Like how come you're not crying right now? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you should be crying because, like, life's meaningless, right? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> you have to have some imaginary, imaginary friends, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, and that is one of the theories that um, religion, uh, we evolved to have religion, uh, shared yeah. myths in order to give hope, meaning, and purpose, and, and survival. Like, my, my sister believed that God would heal her. She had MS. She passed away earlier this year. And she truly believed that God would heal her. And so she had, yeah. the, she had the feeding tube put in and all this to keep her alive in order... Um, so that God, she could give God more time to decide to heal her. Mm. So if you look on that on an evolutionary level, evolution worked. Mm. It kept her alive for probably an extra five years because, mm. because of that false belief. In my opinion, it was a false belief. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I wonder now, like, do we still need it? Um, like, is it still beneficial? Obviously, it was beneficial for survival at some point. That's why it, it, it's here. I actually think we do. Uh, not necessarily religious false beliefs or myths, but uh, we need something. Um, when I say we, I mean society in general. Whether certain individuals right. need it or not, I don't know. Like, I don't feel I need it. But right. I, I look at some of my friends and family and people on YouTube, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, they need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. That's a good point. Yeah.
Uh, I think it gets a little bit um, worse in like a in a harm sense when it tends to like relate to like pseudoscience and like when you say oh, like faith healing, you don't need to go to a doctor. Like um, God will heal you or whatever. Um, Which so God did you worship? Um, like the Indian, like uh, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. Brahma isn't really worshipped. It's mostly just Vishnu and Shiva. Now, did you believe in, would you have called yourself a polytheist? Um, or, or would you call yourself really, a pluralist? It, it's more like they're just, they're, there's only like, well, like Vishnu and Shiva, I would have said, are just the same God, just different forms of the same God. So I would have said that I'm like kind of a monotheist, but because it's like they're just different versions of the same god okay christians did you hear what he this former hindu said that he would have considered himself a monotheist and i dare to say most hindus on the planet would say they're monotheistic in the year 2020 would you agree mm. with that yeah i think so. so so some will say that all gods are kind of part of the ultimate like brahman which is like the ultimate like that that's the the highest supreme god or whatever um other people will say that oh no shiva is the highest and he's the main god then like everyone has a main god basically every the other gods are just like um like demigods in comparison like angels basically did like they don't really do much like indra um like he he's the king of the gods supposedly but he's just a random guy who does like rain and stuff like no one takes him seriously. <laughs> How old were you when you left Hinduism? Um, well, it never happened like all of a sudden. It was like Okay, well, when when the process and... started, do you think? Um, probably in grade 12, I think. Now, was so it because was... did you meet a girl who was an atheist or something? <laughs> no, I wish. Oh, you wish. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what would you say would be like the top three things that caused you to doubt that Hinduism was true? Um, like, I'm, I'm not really sure. Like, I just, I wasn't like super into it. I wasn't like super religious in the beginning. Um, like, I, I definitely did believe I went, so I went were, to the temple. You were a backsliding I, Hindu. I guess, yeah. Have you heard of that phrase, backsliding? Like you believe, but you don't actually do this stuff. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Like most Christians are backsliders. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I was always a backslider, and then it just uh, like after I like I stopped caring about it for a while, and then when I went back to the question of oh, does a God exist? I was like, wait a second, what's the evidence? So. It, do you think you could actually, if I paid you money to pretend to be a committed Hindu, that you could convert a Christian to Hinduism? Convert a Christian? Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Or do Hindus even care about that? Do they want Christians to become Hindus? Um. Well, they're not necessarily, like, they don't necessarily want to convert people, but um, they, like, they think their religion is, like, better in because it's not exclusive right right because it's not exclusive so a, a lot of hindus will say that all gods like um allah um jesus are just different names for the same thing right hmm. uh, obviously they don't know that um or maybe they aren't like fully aware of how the contradictions because, like, yeah, I mean, in, in the Bible, it says, like, oh, you know other gods before me or whatever. So Now, did you have holy texts, like, that you read every day or every week, like the Vedas or anything? So I, I read a, a little bit of the Gita, like, maybe the first chapter, and then, like, I got bored. Yeah, it <laughs> seems like a lot of these ancient texts are just so incredibly boring. Yeah. 
like the Old Testament, most of it's extremely boring, except for all the bloody parts, and then that's gruesome. <laughs> and then the New Testament is uh, not, the New Testament's actually not that boring, except for Revelations just out there. And the Quran, I started reading the Quran a few years ago, and to me it was very similar to the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. The Book of Mormon, yeah, was basically a similar to the Old Testament, New Testament all combined together. Yeah. Are you yeah, the, I, the, the first chapter was literally just listing names of people on the battlefield. Like, that's literally all it was. So it was so dumb. <laughs> Are you a subscriber to my channel? Um, no pressure. I don't think so, no. I have a lot of subscriptions. Do you have you watched my channel many times before? Not really, to be honest. How did you find this link, or how did you so, find my channel today? So uh, Reed linked uh, Reed Nice Wonder. Yeah. Cordial Curiosity. So he linked it in one of the servers I'm in. So I just clicked. It. Ah, I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Reed's Reed's good at marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, Jane Duarter is in the live stream chat. I would really love to talk to you because she says she's a convert to Islam, which means she wasn't raised in it, I don't think. Mm. Jane, Jane, would you be willing to come on and have an atheist try to lead you to hell? <laughs> Watch me smile when I say that. I'm just, I'll be gentle. <laughs> But anyhow, a cure, a cool. It was really nice talking to you. Yeah, nice talking to you. I'll see you later. Okay, bye. I want to open the seat here. I know Jane wants to come on. Jane is feeling the power of Allah right now, saying that Allah could use her to lead me to the truth of Islam. Don't fight it, Jane. Don't fight Allah. You know the will of Allah. Don't be scared. Same with you Christians listening. Don't fi fight the will of the Holy Spirit. He's impressing on your heart right now that even though that Pine Creek guy is like sarcastic, condescending sometimes and, and uh, mocking that you have, you could be the person who breaks that hard hearted Pine Creek guy. Taya and then I will make the rounds, you know, from all the either Muslim channels or Christian channels or Jewish channels or Mormon channels. And people ask, well, Doug, you were an atheist, right? Yeah. Well, what changed your mind? Why did you become a Muslim? Jane. It was Jane. <laughs> or it was David. There I was minding my own business on a YouTube live stream and David came on. And he, we start talking about meaning and hope and purpose, and I just broke down in tears. And I realized it was like, poof, Jesus is real. I don't know for miracles, but to me, that's a miracle. <laughs> I think, Joshua Howard, I think people are truly scared of me for some reason. Or scared just being on on uh, audio video. And apologists won't come on because they got everything to lose and nothing to gain. To me, to them, to apologists listening, I am um, their sister, and I'm like it's like I'm arm they're arm wrestling their sister. Everything to lose, nothing to gain. But here's, let me tell you why uh, I am not a Muslim. 
and it's very, very simple. The core proposition of Islam is that about, what, 1400 years ago, a god named Allah sent um, uh, Gabriel, the very words of Allah, to uh, Muhammad. I don't believe that. Okay, I know this person. Rob, Rob, Rob. What are you doing to me? Hey, dog. What's up? Your, uh, your audio is horrible, but I can still hear you. Wait, I'll... Uh, is it good? Or do you want me to switch this off? Well, it depends what you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you want, um, what do you want to talk about? No, I'm just, uh, I literally just started driving and I just was, you know, clicking my phone. Oh, you're the only one live stream. So I thought, Jane, Jane's not coming on. And you were, you were saying that the Holy Spirit was pressing it on me. So I thought, all right, I'll just click the link and put a smile on your face, Doug. So. Oh. Yeah, uh, for those of you who don't, who don't know, this is Rob from Sent Sentinel Apologetics. He lives in Australia, Melbourne, right? Yeah. And um, we've known each other, what, three years, four years, five years? I don't know. When's the first I time? Think something like that, yeah. yeah. And Rob is a Christian, Trinitarian, non Calvinist. Uh, probably post millennial, probably partial preterist. How am I doing? Hundred percent. Keep going. Evolution. Everything. Oh yeah, he's everything a the theistic yeah. evolutionist. Common descent, right? Everything. Everything. Um, well, the topic today, since you came late, was how do you deal with the Old Testament atrocities? And I played a video of a guy who I think was a Marcionite. He probably doesn't call himself a Marcionite, but he basically thinks that Yahweh in the Old Testament is Satan, and Satan is Yahweh. Have, yeah. you, ever, have you ever heard of that before? That's the, uh, that's the equivalent that I see a lot of Arab Christians do to honor Islam, that Allah is Satan. Satan's more, uh, more holy than Allah or something like that. Yeah. No, but this, like guy, the this guy says they're the same entity. That, that Satan is not a messenger of Yahweh, but... Yeah, Satan, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's sort of the same argument, yeah. 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 But I think, let, tell me if I'm wrong, but the way you handle these Old Testament tro atrocities is you reject that God actually said those things and did those things? Uh, yeah, it's, it's accommodation. So, like, God accommodates it, and at the same time, it's sort of like a de-evolution of the psychology of early humans that he has to work with. Like yeah. he, has to, he has to devolve them to come out of that, what, what is normal to them. So if, do you believe that the Israelites b believed that Yahweh told them to slaughter the Canaanites and the Amalekites? Yes. Yeah. And you believe that uh, Yahweh didn't step in to correct their misperceptions. Yeah, so that yeah 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 so that um, well, you know the whole language of like then later prophets bring this up that Israel was a light to the nation. So this notion of in Deuteronomy thirty, you know, choose life like this before your life and death, but choose life. Um, the ultimate context is that it's just bizarre. And all ancient areas involved are just bizarre. Like, for example, not, I mean, you do have an atheist audience, so I, I guess I can be crude. But no, no, have, no, no, like, no. There's a lot of Christians in here, uh, and Muslims, actually. Okay. <laughs> no, seriously, they're, they're in here. I was going to give, like, a Middle Assyrian example of a, of a law that, you, that is devolved into the new... Like, it's, it's reduced, it's, it's lessened in the Old Testament. I was gonna go into. I was gonna give like a sexual example, which is pretty funny. But um, but here's here's yeah, here's all right. Here's yeah. my problem with your way out of it, and that is, if you say that okay, it says in First Samuel 15 that uh, Yahweh commanded this to happen, and you're saying, well, Yahweh never really really commanded that, but people just thought he did. 
where do you draw the line and now say, well, geez, 500 people didn't really appear in front of, or Jesus really didn't appear in front of the 500. It just says that, like, do you now just say that, well, no, the New Testament is more historically accurate than the Old Testament? Uh, well, I, how I deal with it is exactly with respect to literary analysis. So a Corinthian letter is written, I mean, Paul's vocabulary, the language of his day, the ge geographical setting, which is current, that's totally different to the hyperbolic language of the Old Testament, because, again, ancient areas and customs are far removed from New Testament stuff. Um, so with, um, with the whole Amalekites thing, if I go down the more supernatural route, like if I just hypothetically hold that as true, the whole Nephilim, supernatural Nephilim context, then technically then it's actually quite interesting and quite um, uh, righteous for God to do what he does. If we, if, we, if, we, if we rob the supernatural element and we just see it as a pure natural, like human tension narrative, then yeah, then the whole thing becomes barbaric and quite evil. Would you leave Christianity or Judaism or any Abrahamic faith? Like, would you leave it all if it were true that the text actually means what it says? So, so let's say we could find the author it, of yeah. Samuel. You would leave? No, no, I'm saying the text is what it says when we read it raw. It's just then there's the, uh, then there's the, the subjective sort of like, inclusion on the text, whether you say there is a divine supernatural element going on in the sense of like, God's literally working with it or not, like it's just human subject. If it's just human subjects, it's no different from other engineering texts. No, but I'm saying if it were true that the author of the book of Samuel meant what he said, that this is... No, let me put it this way. Let's say God is real and exists, but he actually commanded those things. Would you worship that guy? Uh, I would worship him in the, in that, in the understanding of the, the reasons and the rationale as to why he brought out those stipulations. Um, and it, it wasn't his desire, but he, there, was a, there, was, there was a reason as to why he did that. No, but what if he told That's you... I'm getting at the supernatural conflict. What if he told you that yeah. he killed... He wanted uh, the babies, women, and children killed because uh, he just did. He d and he, that's all he told you. It's just like, don't question me, Rob. I am God. But it, it is clear to you that this God did these things. You would still worship him? No, I would not. In fact, I would, I would echo Jonah. Because Jonah actually did the reverse. He's like, why don't you kill these people? It's like, you know, I know also Psalm 139. Oh, is it 137 or 139? Like the interrogatory Psalm. Like, like, God, I want you to smash the babies against the rocks, just like how the Babylonians did that to us. And yet there's this convenient silence where God, like, removes himself from that. And it's like, no, I'm not going to do that. Okay. So this is my last question to you, because uh, David is a Christian lis listening in, and he's waiting. But if you would, if you would not worship god for doing those things in the old testament do you believe in eternal conscious torment no are you a universalist no are you an, i'm sort of i'm i'm very just like in all, all the other positions I'm, I'm i'm very nuanced and i'm quite uh i'm still going through the weeds as far as early christian thought on this thing of Okay. Hell and theosis okay. And all that stuff. What if yeah. what if Jesus were to come down to us today and say, "Hi, Pine Creek, how's it going?" And then he looks at you and he says, "By the way, Rob, eternal conscious torment is the correct interpretation of hell. Would you worship Jesus?" Uh, if there's a rational reason, then okay. If there's not, and at, at the end of the day, that thought experiment means he exists, right? Yeah. So then I'll have to. I'll have to go, I'll have to then make a choice. If it's not rational, logical, I'll have to say no. It's interesting that on both yeah. questions you answered, there has to be a rational reason. 
But when it comes to the problem of evil, a lot of atheists are told, well, God would have morally sufficient reasons for things. Would it be fair for if, if I hear that, would it be fair of me to say, well, I need to know what those morally sufficient reasons are, and until I do, I would reject it. Is that fair? Sure, yeah. I, I'm speaking as an ex-atheist myself. I, I, I understand that thought process. Okay. Yeah. Well, we've been going uh, over five minutes, uh, and uh, I'm going to let David in now. So good to, good to see you. No worries, Doug. Thank you. You take care. Bye. Okay. Let's let David in. Hopefully it works. Let's t turn that off. Can you hear me, David? So, David, if you go up, you'll see the gearbox for settings, and you can make your the correct mic your mic, and if you want to be seen, your camera your camera, and then you refresh the little, you come back, you leave, and you come back out, or you come back in. Actually, you know what? You don't have to refresh anymore. Just go up to that gearbox on the top right, make sure your settings are right. I've been getting, um, Roman Catholics are now really mad at me. Some Muslims, I think, are upset with me. I wouldn't say mad, but upset. Uh, who else? I don't think I've peeved off Mormons enough yet. But it's nice to see some pushback from Roman Catholics and, um, and Muslims for once, instead of all the evangelicals. Reported Beast says, Pine Creek, why don't you believe in God? Uh, that's a good question. I would say that it's from insufficient evidence. More specifically, there's certain claims that are pretty big. And with big claims, I would need big evidence. I am open to the idea of a God, of a deity of some sort. But when I look at the world around me, I would say if a God does exist, it would probably not be omniscient, not be omnipotent not to be um, that great of a god. In fact, I understand why there's polytheists in the world who believe in type of not powerful gods because the universe is kind of messed up. So if, uh, if there is a creator god, this god is not that good at creating. What would it take for me to become a believer in God? It depends on which god you're talking about, but in the... Judea Christian type God, it would take a pretty amazing miracle demonstrated right in front of me and others I, just to show that I'm not going crazy. I think there's precedent for the, in the Old Testament, First Kings 18. I have some toilet paper here. Let's uh, soak it in water and pray in the name of Jesus right now that it'll be lit in fire like in Elijah did in First Kings 18. That would raise my confidence. Now, don't tell me, well, magicians can do that with a 50% ethanol, 50% water mixture. Um, actually, even with toilet paper, that would be hard to do with that mixture. I know those tricks, but I also know how to make sure that they're not a trick. And I understand how um, it tells me to reload, then I can select to allow permission, but, it's never, but it never lets me do that. It tells me to reload. Huh. I don't know, David. Uh, maybe reboot your phone or your computer. I don't know. Why don't you try coming back in again and see if it gives you the same problem or it doesn't even let you back in. Make sure everything is closed, then reopen whereby. But I am thankful to Rob, if you're still listening, that um, you would not worship a God that would do those things in the Old Testament and that you would not worship a God that would send people to hell eternally. But it's a tough one, right? Because in a hypothetical, if it's true that hell is, the traditional view of hell is correct, wouldn't you force yourself to believe in order to avoid it? But even if you did force yourself to believe, wouldn't this God who would know that see that and send you there anyhow so it's a catch 22. 
Carl 2.0 says, you seem to expect the world to look a certain way if a God existed. What, what justified this expectation? Um, my experience. So, for example, Carl 2.0, I think you and I are very similar. I think if you walked up to a house and you opened the door and the door fell off and you walked into the dining room and the roof fell in uh, and you walked into the hallway and you fell through a hole... I think you and I are very similar. We would look at each other and say, hmm, whoever designed this house messed up, screwed up. And I think you, if you're agreed with me on that, that we share that same expectation, we can now apply that to the universe. We see it as, what, 96% empty space, uh, less than 1% of inhabitable space, and even on our planet, 65% water, 70% water. And we can't swim. I mean, we can't live underwater. We can swim. I can't swim. Well, I can swim, but not really swim. It's either too hot or too cold on our planet. So, oh, and then you got like wisdom teeth appendices. You got giraffes with, uh, with uh, nerves going all the way up to its neck and back down. It's like... It, it just, there's so many messed up things in our universe, you would have to conclude, well, this God is not that great of a designer, not that great of a creator. Joshua Phillips says, I don't think that follows. Why would you compare a human builder to God? Well, because that's everything in my experience is human builders, human this, human that. See, when people say things, now let me appeal to you, Joshua Phillips. Let me resonate with you. When you see a mother cradle her child in her arms and the child looks up and smiles and the mother looks down and smiles and all that good stuff, don't you see the reflection of God's love? Do you not see the reflection of God's love there? If you answer yes, then we can look at bad things in the world and say that should be a reflection of not love. We can do the same thing with design. We can see design and see or see good design and see bad design. So I understand why Christians hate to compare God to humans, but yet you guys do it all the time on the good stuff. And I understand what Christians say with the 96%, 90% empty space thing. Well, we needed all those black holes and dark uh, energy and everything to cause the expansion of the universe and, and finely tuned and to make it work. And, and God was, no, no, if God is all powerful, he can make the universe any way he wants. Okay, this is Carl. I think he, I just talked to him. Hey, Carl, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Uh, do you want to be seen or not? Um, I I don't have a preference. I'd rather not be seen if that's okay with you. But that's okay with if me. If you think it would help your viewership, yeah, that's great. Um, I was kind of in chat, and I was I was I wanted to probe you on some of your claims. I, I take it that to say that the world is, is in a way that an omniscient, omnipotent, good God wouldn't allow takes a supplementary claim, which is that the world could be better mm -hmm. or that such a God could have made the world better or that even such a God has an obligation to make the world better. Do you, dis and I'm wondering do, do you disagree that, that the world could be better? I think, I think one could make very strong arguments that common sense morality requires an ample amount of pointless evil. I think there's very powerful arguments to be made for that claim. And I think you could also make arguments of a sort that conclude that a God does not have an obligation to make a perfect world or a world without pointless evil he only has an obligation to make a relatively good world. And I think there's even a third strain of arguments, and this is something I'm personally working on, where you posit a kind of a theistic multiverse. I don't know if you've heard of fine-tuning arguments and atheists who say, who deal with the fine-tuning through a multiverse. There's a theistic version that's being worked on right now in philosophy of religion that claims that it's possible that God could have made uh, a theistic multiverse where all the universes are good, overall good. So their summation is infinitely good. And every single good universe or sort of good universe would have to be instantiated. Okay, can I stop you there? Sure. Uh, I need you to turn down my audio. 
Okay. Or get headphones. Check one, two. That's okay. better, I think. Let me see. Okay. Um, I am totally open to the idea of God, and I usually don't push back on general theism or deism because uh, I just don't. It's like if that helps you get up in the morning, have hope, meaning, and purpose, so be it. What I'm more concerned about is specific theism because that's what determines how you live your life. Now, I have markers in my life that would change my mind and accept that or raise my confidence that a God exists. But I just tell you that things like fine-tuning doesn't do it for me. But what would cause you, what's the marker in your life to say, well, first of all, are you a specific theist? <laughs> His dad came in or someone. Sorry. That's right. Um, what, are you a, what, what are you? Are you a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, a Mormon, a Scientologist? What are you? I am a, I'm an agnostic. I, I, I have a Catholic past, um, but a lot of philosophy religion has kind of affected my belief scheme. Okay. And one of the things that I deal with is, I think, I think the primary source for the evidence for God is testimonial. And I think the greatest issue you have to work with as a Christian is, even if you have troubles with particular scriptures, is how does testimonial evidence justify something like an infinite being? That seems like the sort of thing that is really difficult. But what do you believe in? What God do you believe? I, don't, I, I used to believe in the Christian God. I don't believe in a God now. But if I was to believe in one, it would probably be the perfectly good, omnipotent, omniscient sort. Why should you um, believe in a God? Why should one believe in a God? You, not one. You. Why should you, Carl, believe in a God? I think I think I, I would I, I would believe in a God, or I should believe in a God, if I have good epistemic reasons to do so. If I, if I have good evidence for such a God. So, I, no, not, since not, you not don't believe in a reasons. God, since you don't believe in a God currently, that means you do not have justifiable reasons to believe in a God right now. I, yeah, I, I do not believe in God right now because the summation of my of the evidence given by of, of, of the justification given by a priori arguments and testimonial evidence to their Bible, I don't think it's sufficient to justify belief in God. Okay, we're agreed. From a purely rational point of view. But we're, but I probably agree with you on a lot. I'm just wondering how is it that you deal with fine-tuning or how is it that you deal with people that say you don't have the moral knowledge to, to, well, make, to make the problem the of evil work? The fine-tuning one is pretty easy for me because if you believe an all-powerful creator, God created the universe, he could have yeah. created it in any way. He could have set the dials to anything. <laughs> So the whole fine-tuning argument falls apart because you could say, well, universe A was fine-tuned, universe B was fine-tuned, universe C was fine-tuned. There, If everything is fine-tuned, then nothing's fine-tuned. You can just, God could have made a universe that is the flat earth model. God could have made a universe like we see now. God could have, so it's, to me, it, it's, as simple as that, and I hear guys like Luke Barnes, they talk for hours and hours about the fine-tuning argument, and I'm just going, what? If you believe that God can create in any way he sees fit, then this whole fine-tuning argument just crumbles. I, I think that a theist wouldn't grant you the first counterfactual statement, which is that God could have created the world any, any way he wishes. I, th I think the idea is that God would have had to create the world with some surplus or some amount of value, especially good value. And the idea is that the sheer amount of good value in our world, whether it's a flat earth world or a round world or a world with these metaphysical constants or those metaphysical constants, it's a world filled with beauty and value and goodness. And that's the sort of thing that calls for explanation over and above the constants. Unless it's an evil God. Uh, and, and that's another thing is it, it could very well be an evil God. And I think I, 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 for one of my classes, I've written a paper about why a morally indifferent God is more likely than a morally good God. And I, and I think that's a very powerful argument to be made. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think Stephen it's a hard... Lott, it? You're going to have Sorry? to turn your volume down some more because I'm getting feedback, but... Um, I apologize. Um, I, but yeah, Stephen Law makes that that uh, argument that you can have an evil God just as easy as a good God and defend it. I, I guess another thing I'm wondering is um, if you are a moral realist or a realist about abstract objects like you know logic or, or morality or even metaphysical constants, what do you ground that stuff in? That's kind of another brute fact presupposition. One. Say it again. Brute fact presuppositions. Brute, brute fact presuppositions, as in just moral facts of an independent existence are not grounded in anything, or no, that it's the it's it, it's the, in itself is the grounding. 
So, for example, my presupposition would be that the universe exists and has the properties it has, including the three laws of logic. So basically, I, so basically, I would say this is something similar as the presuppositional Christians. I would say that it is necessary. It's not contingent. It is what it is. And if they ask me why, I say it is what it is, just like the nature of your God is what it is and not something different. And they hate that answer, but basically I'm giving the same answer they give. Yeah. No, I agree with you there. Uh, do, you, do you have troubles with the epistemology of the stuff without God? Do, do you think that, do, do you have some sort of naturalized epistemology of moral facts or logical facts or any of that stuff? To me, my confidence is raised when I see repeatable stuff happen that can be verified with uh, machines and other people. So to me, epistemology is way more important than ontology because if the ontology is there, who cares if we can't know what it is? So to me, I, I still acknowledge ontology, but I think epistemology is way, way more important. I agree. And, and what would be your epistemology of moral knowledge? Would it be, you said, repeatability? or? Oh, no, with the moral stuff? Um, I think I'm not one of those atheists who believes that in objective moral values. I think uh, morality evolved like we did. Uh, what is it, Sharon Street? Or, or do you think that it's just natural properties that it's reducible to? Yeah. Well, not moral truths? Yeah. yeah. I could, but I could be wrong about that. I, if, and if, but that problem is if the ontology of morality is something from a deity or a, even a natural thing, it gets back to epistemology. How would we know what the right moral thing to do is? And, and do we even need to know? Is it just on our hearts, as the Christian would say? You know, is, right. it, just, is it our intuitions? Yeah. I, I want to share just one thing before I leave. Um, th this is something, this is a paper my professor is working on, and maybe this is a new idea you haven't heard of, and maybe it will help you in the future. Uh, he's been working on this fascinating response where if you, lived, if you lived in a world where every single evil had a purpose, if there were no pointless evils uh, or pointless suffering, you would have a reason to go out and try to cause evil because you know God would somehow account for that evil or work that evil into the, the, the goodness fabric of the world. And so from an epistemic point of view, uh, he's, he's writing a paper where he's arguing that a certain ratio of, of pointless evil is required for common sense morality to be um, a reality for us, for us to have reason to act morally or to avoid suffering or avoid evil. Because if it was the case that all evil has some greater purpose, we could go outside and try to kill a child and have the faith that God would somehow make that work out. So, um, and, and I think that, that general line might be able to deal with a lot of um, pointless evil that like the, the, the fawn or the deer suffering in the forest, stuff like that, I think is bearable. Well, so, uh, I don't know if that really helps anything because you just are saying, well, there's a point to it, but we don't know what it is, right? Well, the point was that if you knew what the point to it was, you would have no reason to act morally in the world. You, you could just do whatever you want and expect God to. So, so think of it this way. God values moral action and moral development. There's a sense in which if you were sure of what the moral reasons are for everything or the moral nature of everything is, or if you were sure that every single evil is somehow accounted for in the end, you would have great reason to go outside and try to cause evils because God would somehow work them into the fabric of the goodness of the world. But do you know beforehand, before you do the evil, that God's going to work it out and you know exactly well, how he's going to work it out? Where if you lived in a world where every evil is... None of the evils are pointless evils. That's that's the sort of world you would live in, where you, by you going outside and causing an evil, it would have some point. If God allows it, it has some point. Yeah, but you need some you need some ratio of pointless evils. In fact, a great ratio. Because think of it this way: if only ten percent of evils are pointless evils, then you still have a ninety percent chance that whatever evil you cause will create something good. I think this argument could get you to a point where the world has to have actually a majority, over fifty percent pointless evils, to allow for moral action. And so the idea here is that. If moral action is valuable, not only good events, but just moral development and moral responsibility is valuable, then God might have to allow evils just to generate that. That might be a logical necessity or metaphysical necessity. I guess it would be metaphysical necessity. Now, I see you smirking. I don't think you find that very convincing, but maybe no. you can give me a reason why. Well, I'm just trying to apply it. I, I'm still getting the audio problems with you. Maybe mute yourself when you're not talking. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to apply that to something more tangible and practical, like I'm a parent, my child um, is saying I need to disobey and do something bad because my dad will make something good out of it. Is that basically the gist? 
know, the, the gist is this. So imagine you as a parent know that no matter what you do to a child, it will produce a good outcome. So now you have a reason to try to rape your child, abuse your child, hit your child, because you know that in the end it will somehow benefit them. So if you have a God that respects not good outcomes but good parenting, he will produce the opportunity to be a bad parent. Okay, yeah, there has so to be an after. Way. There has to be an afterlife in this scenario then, in order for it to work. Why? Why does it have to be an afterlife? It's, if God values moral judgment in your real life, because how how can it, it be good to if you kill your child? How can that benefit your child if there's no afterlife? No, no, sorry. So, so maybe I was unclear. So the, the analogy here is that. The argument is you need some set of pointless evils to um, make moral action possible. In the parenting, the, the analogy in parenting example is you need some you, you need some possibility or some presence of bad parenting examples around you to understand that if you were to hit your uh, child and abuse your child and rape your child, they would they would become a bad child. Okay. If all you saw around you was great children who were great children regardless of, you, of their parents raping them and abusing them, then you would have an excellent reason to rape and abuse your child because you would know they would turn out fine anyway. Yeah. So the idea here is that you need that ratio of pointless evils or bad parenting to give you a reason to be a good parent. And if God values good parenting and not just good outcomes, then he would produce those pointless evils and allow yeah. them to happen. I'm sorry, but this sounds like the Frank Turek, uh, you need evil to have good and all that sort of thing. You need darkness. You need light to know what darkness is and all that sort of thing and vice versa. Right? Is that basically it? No, I, I think those views uh, have some sort of like mythical... Um, uh, yin and yang sort of property that I'm, I'm not shooting for. I'm literally shooting for this to be uh, from the agent's point of view. God values you as an agent to be able to do moral action coherently. That allows that, that requires that you understand that there that, that, that there is pointless evil in the world, where that is a hindrance, where, where that makes you want to prevent evils and to not do evils yourself. And unless you deny those two claims, which I think you can, but I'm just posing this to you, I, th I think you, you can make a good argument for God allowing pointless evils, or, and actually a very large ratio of them, insofar as he wants to, you to have a good reason to act morally. Because common sense morality says you shouldn't go outside and shoot a child. If you think there's no pointless evils in the world, then go outside to sh and try to shoot a child, because God will somehow make that into a good outcome. Yeah, Whether but nobody you believe believes that. <laughs> say that, say that? No, nobody believes that, that there's no pointless evils. I well, mean... But, but, but from the theist point of view, he says God is compatible with pointless evils because of this framework. So this would be a way to deal with the problem of evil, which I take it to be one of the biggest challenges. No, God. yeah. Well, this is this is how the real problem of evil is. Why would a God create in the first place? So it it even goes before humans. Well, I, I if the question is. The theists can have an objective list moral point of view where they say X, Y, Z are good things. And, and insofar as God is good, he will create a world with good things in it. Insofar as moral, moral action is good, uh, consciousness is good, um, happiness is That doesn't is matter. Good. Why not? Because, uh, at least in the Christian worldview, if there is a God that exists in three persons, you have love, you have all good you have all powerful, you have all knowing, at least most Christians believe this, not all. Uh, how can you top that? You can't top that by creating stuff. Is the idea here that if you are evaluating the world, you are including God in it, and if there's already an infinite goodness, you don't need to add on anything else to exactly. surplus the infinite goodness? Any act of creation would be causing a world that is not as good as the first world. Which has only God in it. Right. I, I, I disagree. So, so say that, and I think this is why God has to be somewhat utilitarian. If, if God has X amount of value, even if that value is infinite, I, I think we're assuming that you cannot get more than infinite stuff, which is, a, I think it's a mathematical claim that is largely unpopular. So you can get better. Than infinity. So you're saying you can get better than God alone. Yeah. And, and, and I think what, I think God values, I think, I think from, from a, from a reasonable theistic point of view, God values moral judgment and moral uh, personhood. Which God has, but actually to a to a, to a limited degree by Himself. And think of it. So, so here's a very good way to put it: If you value moral relationships or moral characters, uh, you you as an agent alone cannot have a moral relationship with yourself. You need other agents around you to, right, the to be involved in moral relations with. And so the idea here is, God by Himself is infinitely good, but there is no moral development or moral interaction He can have by Himself. He needs other agents to produce these connections. He needs. With. Well, yeah, I, I think insofar as definitionally, yeah, moral relationships are between two people. He, he, logic—it's logically necessary so that God, God is, have more God than is needy. To God is very needy. 
Yeah. See, yeah, I think this I is the, yeah, if you want to mute yourself, this is uh to me the real problem of evil is creation. And the only way you can get not the only way, there's three ways to get out of it. And you mentioned it. You have to say God is needy and that he's not self sufficient. He needs to create. It's part of his nature. He's just like, I'm so lonely. I need something to, I need something to love and something to love me. So that's one way out of it. The other way to out of it is to say God's not all knowing. And so He's like, okay, I'm going to create, but I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, will these, uh, will they fall? Will they go against me? Will they cause evil? Natural, and, and will there be natural evil as a result and all this? I don't know. I'm going to be surprised. Let's just try it. So that's another way out of it. The third way is to say that it's just part of his nature to create, that God is, doesn't have free will. So those are the three ways out of it, to say God is not omnipotent or not omniscient or that he doesn't have free will. That's the real problem of evil. And I don't think anything can solve it other than those three things, combination of these things. But any time you try to solve it with those three things, you're making God like Pine Creek and like Carl. You're making God more like a human. And this is why I think polytheism, those like the Thor and the and uh, Odin, they're more a realistic type of God than Yahweh or Allah. I, I, I think the, the first... Uh version is an uncharitable reading of the third version and um i remember reading the small pamphlet by alvin pantinga called uh, nature of god the nature of god i think one of the hardest questions for the metaphysics of god is what is god nature and what causes god to act and i think that's a very difficult question and even if you go back as far as the catholics catholic philosophers you will find people like anselm redefining free will to apply to god having one version of free will that applies to god and having another version of free will that applies to humans because there are certain issues that they cannot deal with Within that framework, but 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 I think there's nothing implausible to say. There's nothing implausible in saying that God has a nature which requires Him to act, or whether that requirement and restriction is not a bad thing because the nature is perfect. I take it that a nature which wants to have moral relationships with other beings is a good nature. Um, and, and so so, from my point of view, if I was a the theist, I would probably be taking the third point of view and trying to explain how God having a nature that quote unquote restrains Him isn't actually a bad thing. Because it isn't really a restraint. It, it, the, the, him wanting to be w in a moral relationship with other beings is a product of his perfection, not a product of his neediness or his fear or loneliness. Can I ask you uh, a more personal question? Why does, like, I, I, this is kind of fun talking about this, but it seems that there's a difference between you and me. I can view this purely as a... Uh, Let's smoke a cigar and talk about interesting stuff. But for you, it sounds like this is almost more personal. Like, do you does do you want a God to exist? Do you desire a God to exist? Do you want this to be true? Because you said earlier on that you're agnostic and you really don't believe right now. I, I haven't wanted God to exist to exist since I was about six years old. I think I have a very deep. Uh, intellectual curiosity when it comes to the the ontological cauldron of the world. I want I want to know all the stuff that exists and what reasons I have for thinking that it exists. Uh, th the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because I think out of all the entities that are being discussed in philosophy today, whether that's moral truths, mathematical truths, um, modal truths, whatever, God as an entity is probably the most interesting subject in modern philosophy. So that's why I'm I'm just passionate really? about philosophy as a whole. And God is I yeah, I think God is an absolutely fascinating subject from from just a metaphysical ontological point of view that's why i'm so passionate about this it's not a personal desire for him to exist um yeah like to me it gets back to epistemology if we can't know anything about this god then who cares and and this is i think uh one of the first book i read about god was by richard swimber and he approaches he approaches this from an inductive point of view he gives arguments and he says well this this, this should increase our credence in god by point two and he adds them up and then he has the problem of evil at the end and so my point of view is you actually do have relatively decent uh, reasons, a priori reasons, for thinking that a godlike being exists. And I think you have certain reasons to think that he doesn't exist, which is the problem of evil. And I think the challenge of philosophy or philosophy of religion should be to, A, uh, strengthen the first arguments and to, to, to weaken the second, if you're, a the, if, you're, if you're arguing from the theistic point of view, to weaken the, the second arguments. And then, and then you get into the Bible and say, okay, well, not, now that we have this framework of a god that we have good reason – to think exists, uh, here is the ecclesiastical or, or scriptural stuff that, that fits well with this. And I think that that's, that might be the most difficult move, but I think it's the first part that is very important to, to do before you even get to the second part of evaluating scriptures. Yeah. To, what me, you yeah, have yeah. Framework. Yeah. to me, it's a very dangerous to create God through philosophy. It's like, 
sit in your chair and just think deeply enough and you can show that God exists or more likely to exist and more likely not. It's, uh, this is just the way I am, like uh, the way I'm built, I guess. It's like, if you can't demonstrate it, then move along. <laughs> so. I, I think there's a deeper debate to, to be had about a priori reasoning. Uh, what, you call, what you call sitting around and uh, thinking about this, I call armchair philosophy or a priori philosophy. And I think that's the grounding of all science and philosophy, if you were to look at the very foundations of thinking, this is all you have. To me, it's not a matter of sitting here and conjuring God out of thin air. It's, it's about having real metaphysical intuitions that I apply to other areas of life and systematizing them and asking, what is the best explanation for my intuitions? And I think that general strategy applies not so only what is to the best this, explanation to for your, This is the last question that I got uh, Martin uh, waiting to come on. What is the best ex explanation for your intuitions, in your opinion? Well, 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 that's that's where my agnosticism comes in. I, I think when I track the best explanations and the costs of those explanations, God, given my current knowledge, um, he brings a lot to the table, but he's also a very heavy cost when it comes to metaphysical simplicity, because God is an infinite being, and he has really fascinating properties that no other things around me have, and that makes me him rephrase. a very exotic entity. Let me rephrase. What's the best explanation for your intuitions? Is it naturalism or God? If, if I could give you a dichotomy. If by naturalism you mean no God. Uh, n nothing that is uh, physically instantiated or nothing that supervenes on the physical, I think naturalism heavily fails in explaining all my intuitions. I think uh, I, I would not, I, I think if you do enough philosophy, it's very hard to be a full naturalist. I think you have to be at least, um, I think you have to be at least a property dualist. I think you have to be at least, you have to have belief in something that is immaterial. Uh, but, God is an immaterial agent, which is a little bit more than an immaterial property or an immaterial fact. What percentage of philosophers today are naturalists? That's not true. Uh, most philosophers today, I, I think, are realists about a whole sway, swath of stuff. Most, most modern analytic philosophers are realists about a whole bunch of stuff, which means they're non-naturalists. No, I was asking you, what percent do you know? What percent percentage of philosophers are not naturalists? Oh, man. Um, I don't know the exact percentage, but I think if you were to go, so philosophy is divided into sections. I think if you were to go into like epistemology, you would you would be hard pressed to find people that are like reductivists or naturalists about epistemic facts. If you were to go into morality, it's more popular in morality, but there's more reductivists in the moral field. Um, and when you get into like logic and metaphysics, I think that's where it's the rarest. So I think it depends on the field. I think it's the most in morality because that's kind of the fad is explaining away moral facts using natural terms. I think Sharon Street might have ushered that in, or maybe uh, probably J.L. Mackey. But uh, in other fields like epistemology, it's very rare that you find naturalists. And this is why when people defend moral realism, they often do this thing where they tie moral facts to epistemic facts or metaphysical facts, and they do partner in crime sort of arguments. 70, so I think 72.8% are atheists of all philosophers in the Phil paper survey and... Yep. And naturalism, I think it's over 50%, but let me see. But yeah, um, thanks for coming on, Carl. Yeah, uh, I want to let Martin come in and have a chance. I usually don't like uh, philosophy that much, but um, I just wanted to get that Phyllis philosopher. Oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, before I let you on, um, let's see, naturalism. I got the paper up right in front of me. I still think it's the majority. I could be wrong. Oh, I was right. Well, I said oh, just over 50%, I think I said, but it's at 50%. Except or lean towards naturalism. So 50% of philosophers, 50% are naturalists or lean that way. And then it's 25% non-naturalism, probably that dualism that Carl was talking about. Okay, let's get to uh, Martin. Can you hear me, Martin? I can hear you, I think. Can you? Yep. All right. Excited. So I'm, I'm not... Uh... I'm not a Christian and, and I'm not very smart, but uh, <laughs> I uh, I did have some thoughts. I hope it's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. All right. Um, yeah, it's just because earlier you said that uh, uh, epistemology was a big part of it's what it's what uh, I'm sorry I'm a bit nervous. It's right. Um, it's um, it's what mattered most to you, right? Yeah. When, when it comes to morality, I think it's a big part because I think, I think if God doesn't exist, 
then theists are moral relativists. Have you ever have you ever heard that? That if God doesn't exist, theists are moral relativists? Yeah, the exact thing they sought to destroy. Because when I ask Christians, okay, how do you found, find out whether something is right or wrong? They always say um, moral intuition. And moral intuition is, is a God-given thing. Yeah. But if it isn't a God-given thing, it's just your opinion, man, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I've heard you use it before as well. Yeah, Christians would say, they would say exactly that. They'd also say that God gives uh, moral decrees and you should follow it. Yeah. They never say why. Well, because God's God. Well, why ought someone obey God? It's just his opinion. Well, no, it's not just his opinion. He's the creator of the universe. So what? Well, no, well, he, but he can see the future. Now we're on to something because maybe he can help us in some way. So that gets, sure, uh, sure. that gets back to epistemology. You can say, Doug, don't do that because I can see what happens if you do do that. And if you do do that, I can help you avoid that because I can see what would happen. But it seems like that doesn't really work for Christians or work for Jews or work for Muslims. On some things, maybe, like the obvious things. But yeah, yeah. But from our, our perspective, it's, we don't think God exists. So if, if they're just acting out their moral intuition and not really thinking about it, just thinking it's from God, like God, God ordained, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of just doing whatever you feel is right, not really thinking about it. Yeah, I, I do think that uh, when you use your level two thinking and you look at the pros and cons, looking to see if it actually helps society or hurts society, uh, it's better than the morality of many Christians. However, they would say it just... It doesn't matter. They divorce well-being from morality, uh, some of them. So whether it helps people or hurts people, that's not the issue. The issue is, does God want this or not? Sure. So, right. so it, it, it boils down to the opinion of the boss, of the opinion of daddy. But it was more um, what you would lose following a theistic morality if God doesn't exist. Is quite a lot. Oh yeah, because that's why a lot of people um, stay stay Christian or stay Muslim or stay, yeah. <laughs> that's why they stay. Morality is a huge one. Yeah, they, but, they they for two reasons. Number one, they feel like they're going to do terrible things if they leave it. Uh, that's a, that's a big one. And another one is what was the other one? I had in my mind. I forget. Doesn't matter. But yeah, it's it's such a huge factor. They think that that they have to stay. You just have to believe in God in order to have a basis for morality and all these things. And if not, it's like their life crumbles. Yeah, but I think there's a, there's, there are better ways to come to morality outside God. But but the theistic morality really hinges on God being real. Because if, if he isn't real, you're just following your intuitions, opinions. Yeah, they would agree um, with that. For example, yeah, okay. But I, to me, when you, when they kind of make these moral arguments and they use, uh, well, it, it certainly feels like we have objective morality. They're not really thinking like um, Pascal's wager sort of thing when it comes to morality. Well, if this is wrong, I, I lose out. I, I am a really, I might not be a moral person if I follow the theistic morality and a God doesn't exist. I don't know. I've had a hard time explaining this to people. But let's take, for example, I see a lot of Christians being against uh, uh, homosexual, yeah, homosexuals. Um, and I think it's a deep human thing to to fear what you don't know. Yeah. Right. But then an atheist might say, "Well, let's look at it. How it corresponds to well-being. Perhaps it's not as bad." But a Christian might just say, "Well, it feels bad, so it is bad." Mm -hmm. So, so, so it's, it's worse than just saying, okay, the culture decides that it's bad. Um, because it's just your opinion, your personal opinion. And I, I, I tried to find some studies as well. And it seems like theistic, uh, theists are. Oh, we lost them. Yeah. Um, I think I remember what I was going to say. It's Christians, Muslims, Jews, they like this idea of a God being the basis of morality so they can tell other people what to do. It's like, this is just not my opinion. The big guy said this, so you better listen. Like, if it was just me saying this, then you can brush me off. But it's not me just saying this. Um, but you made an interesting point about um, 
homosexuality. It's just my intuition says this is icky. This is icky and gross. And so therefore, maybe it's wrong. Okay, this is uh, David. Yeah, you tried to come on earlier, right, David? Are you there? You got to check your settings. You're still muted. Oh, there you are. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, the laptop battery died. I, I didn't hear what you, okay, what you just said. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> it, it doesn't matter. I kind of just summed up. Um, yeah, sure. I, I was basically saying that uh, for theists, this whole idea of God being the basis of morality gives them the the oomph to say that God said this. It's not just my opinion. You don't have to listen to me, but you can yeah. listen to God. And it makes them feel good to say that. It's like, it's like, mm. it's like Popeye. <laughs> I got the spinach power behind me. <laughs> that is true. Well, thanks for the talk. Okay. I'll hop off here. Thanks, Martin. And David's trying to get on here. <laughs> Some funny comments in live stream. So yeah, David's been trying to come on, which is unfortunate that they... go to the gearbox top right. Let's see, can I show you? That didn't work. Oh, that's infinite regress. See, infinite regress does e does exist. It's possible. It's, I've actualized the infinite regress right now. And Christians say that's not possible. These callers have to really stop moving around and shuffling around, says T Z E Kendall. Yeah. Got to give them a break. For some of them, this might be their first time. But sometimes it's like the ASMR thing. It's like, uh, it's like while you're talking, you hear a little bit of rustling in the paper in the background. So Jane, this is the last your last chance. If we pick and choose, then it's objective. Well, you do pick and choose as a Muslim. You pick and choose that Allah is the source of morality. You chose that. You chose your morality by choosing Allah as your standard. Right? Good point, Pine Creek. Sorry, David, I can't help you other than what I've said already. Got to check your settings. Maybe God doesn't want you to talk to me. I don't know. I'm going to start the music and you got, uh, we'll let God decide in two minutes here. That's all right, David, don't worry about it. David, just know that everything I say is right and everything you say is wrong. And that there's nothing you can do to respond. <laughs> oh, there was a good comment here. Where is it? I don't know, Doug. You've been making a lot of bad points today. Okay. Without specifics, I can't respond to that. Do we trust the human authors of various holy books to reveal their deity's moral edicts to accurately record them? Even when they morally disagree with what was revealed? Yeah, that's reason to lower your confidence that this book is holy. But this is where apologists come in. They will explain it to you. Or historians, Christian historians, Jewish historians. What is the COVID policy at the Wichita office? Um, well, 
Satan is a big fan of Trump, so it's like, we don't worry about it. Hey, thank you, my lord, for the donation. If there is no religion, would philosophy not be important to encourage discussion about morality, ethics, logic, epistemology, etc.? That's a good question. I don't know. If you don't believe in God, but just pretended to believe in God, what religion would make the most sense to me? That's an interesting question. What religion out of all the religions in the world makes the most sense to me? I honestly think a religion that does not have omniscience, omnipotence, um, omnipresence, omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. I think you, when you put those three platonic ideas in a god, you're in for trouble. So what religion doesn't have that? Probably the belief in Odin or Thor and just believe that these are non-creator gods and the universe always existed, but these gods are real. And that they're that these gods are kind of stupid and messed up. But I'm serious. Like we had that philosophy guy in here before. You start talking all-knowing, all-powerful, all-free, all-present, all-loving, all-good. You start saying stuff like this, and you run into troubles big time really quickly. the only god that existed was an evil one, would you prefer not to know it or to know it? Hmm. I'd prefer to know it. Because I would want to please my master. Ah, Buddhism. Good point. I didn't even think of that. Buddhism is uh, basically an atheist type religion. I'm kind of a Buddhist already in the fact that I'm um, a bit of a Stoic, right? Aren't Buddhists kind of into Stoicism and, de and squelching desires? Or is that Hinduism? I forget. Poof! Did we get to three hours? No, it's so disappointing. My apologies to the Marcionite guy who is the most interesting Christian. Go check out his channel. It's called uh, Good God. Have a great rest of your weekend, guys. Take care.